Hello and welcome to episode 90 of the Gamers of the Lost Spot podcast. I'm your host, Darren Whittam, and joining me this week, brushing the shell fragments and ink squid from their carting overalls, fresh from the track, it's my Cooper Trooper comrades, Anthony Chesson and James Thomas. Hello. 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 Or as I was saying on Sunday, damn you, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a me, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's weird. I swear Anthony was playing Mario Kart with me, but I could never see him in front of me for some reason. That's weird. I can almost smell the burning pixels and yeah. burning rage by the sound of it as well. <laughs> there was that one corner that I was in front of you. That one <laughs> corner. <laughs> uh, he's, did, he's did, did he say that a lot? On me. <laughs> Oh, brilliant! I feel I feel I'm a bit behind because, like you know, you guys are at the cutting edge playing your Mario Kart on release day. I, I can't play it for thirty days. Um, I'm playing Zelda, which you I, you guys are playing thirty days ago. You've all moved on. It's, it's like a time lapse of uh, of Switch, isn't it? So we'll, we'll see it what we you can see what's happening a month ahead of time, and hopefully it will come down in the sales by the time you reach us. Yeah, absolutely, but unfortunately, it never does. <laughs> that, that, that'd be a good thing. Um, so, James, guest in on the show once again. Thanks for coming. That's um, all right. How, always a pleasure. Ah, oh, brilliant. How are you doing, and how's your week been? Yeah, it's or, been or good. Even your time, been... Or even your time between, you know, I can't remember how many weeks it's been. Oh, it's, it's been about three or four. I can't remember really what happened uh, since last time, but it's been, a, it's been the bank holiday weekend here in the UK, and uh, had quite a quiet one, because um, Ali, my wife, was working over the weekend. She was doing, um, uh, well, she works in a museum, and she was helping out at an open day where she had um, some like stuffed animals and some um, little nature tables set out so you could see some fox poop and stroke a stroke a mouse and that sort of thing she's into the natural history side of things so i lost her for the saturday but um it came to benefit me on the monday because i had to help her take it back into work but it meant that i got a behind the scenes look at her museum in coventry so wow. it was great so yeah it helped take all the the specimens and the trays back um with uh, like a including this gorgeous set of colored butterflies and wow. uh, as reward she showed me where all the fossils were in the in the stores so it's superb I, i'm cool. a proper dinosaur nuts i think like i'm basically the 10 year old that never grew up is it a dinosaur type museum oh no not at all not at all it's it's um it's the herbert in coventry for anyone in that locale but um it's like a it's a general museum so it's a museum and art gallery so it's got a bit of the area a bit of social history a bit of art um some rotating exhibitions so um it's a bit of everything at that point in time um but yeah includes uh, the natural history section and lots of ichthyosaur bits and pieces including this amazing uh, section of the ichthyosaur's rib cage which is like a uh, an ancient dolphin for those not over with the dinosaurs um yeah. and has in it got it, a long sort of swordfish nose thing going on that's the one yeah big pointy yeah. big pointy nose. but inside the the dolphins uh, you've got me saying dolphin now inside the ichthyosaurus <laughs> rib cage you could see what it had for lunch it had loads of little ammonites loads of little shell creatures it was superb so wow. the, the the science nerd in me was going that's, that's amazing what an interesting job that's well cool oh no he's, i just start babbling about it when it gets going because like seeing what they look after behind the scenes is superb because they can only ever have a small percentage on display and then it's their job oh. of like rotating what's on there and making sure that people have access to it but there are some proper little treasures around the back in the back it's like a massive warehouse full of boxes isn't it like where the ark of the covenant stored oh yeah yeah and there's all sort of equivalent things see i know i've seen raiders of the lost ark that's it's virtually fact <laughs> but it, she, she opens this iron door and there's just this vast warehouse with a forklift truck and, and a couple boxes. of Nazis <laughs> yeah there's like Aladdin's lamp is in one <laughs> yeah oh that's just so cool that's amazing yeah it was good it was good so she showed me all like the, the stuffed creatures and what have you and uh, yeah she's prepping some more exhibitions with them and uh, yeah it's just, just always nice to see behind the scenes on those things yeah VIP tour just for you that's it it felt special wow Excellent, excellent. So, uh, Anthony, how's how's your week been? Yeah, not too bad. Um, it's it's been quite an interesting one. I mean, one of the things I wanted to just kind of talk about straight away, um, because I'm still hyper from it, um, and that is today. Um, obviously, we're recording this one day before Star Wars Day, before May the 4th, uh, but today uh, Palette Swap Ninja, who are the uh, kind of creators of some really good kind of game-based tunes I think it, the, the guy who's behind Palette Swap Ninja is Dan Amarik who is, he used to work for Activision um, he used to be kind of very heavily um, in rock band um, and um, and he used to be he used to write for official Xbox magazine in the US as well, but anyway today he dropped a Sgt. Pepper Star Wars mashup album, and this takes 
every single, all 13 tracks of Sgt. Pepper and basically themes them around New Hope. And obviously I'm going to stick a huge show note of this in the show, uh, but it is absolutely fantastic. So the, so the people who bought you the Halo song, my favourite, the Viva Piñata song... Um, which James probably wakes up to every day. Um, <laughs> it's um, they brought us this. It's um, it's it's Princess Leia stole the Death Star plans um, instead of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, and it is just <laughs> genius. If you like anything, I implore you to click on this link because it is just it's fantastic. the The link I'll send you to is like the YouTube page, and every single song um, has like a just a, a YouTube video, um, which is just kind of scenes from star wars a new hope um but there's also a link to um to palette swap ninja's website where this entire album is there for free so you can just download it for free you can give a tip if you want there is a uh a kind of pledge or gofundme page um but it, all 13 tracks are just available to download in mp3 or flac and it's just genius wow i mean i watched the link that you sent me just before yes. we podded and yes it started and i thought oh you know will it be is it going to be any good and i couldn't believe how how sort of in tune it was with with, <laughs> with the original material i was just like wow this is awesome but i did and i was thinking that was good enough but i didn't realize until you just said that it was a whole album oh yeah yeah there is just like instead of when i'm 64 there's aa 23 uh it's just i've got it on my i've now i've kind of downloaded the free uh mp3s and i've got it on on my iphone and i was playing it just before we were potting while i was cooking um there was a you know <laughs> <laughs> there's a little there's illicit help from your friends luke is the desert you know it's just oh it's so funny it just had me clapping and um and just kind of saluting to my sonos as i was <laughs> I was kicking because it's just genius. It's just absolutely genius. It's really good. The words fit really well. They've done some. Work, they've done some work there. It's good, absolutely. And as you're saying, you know, the, not only the the words, but the the way they sing it. You know, they sound like. I mean, Dan Emmerich, and I think there's another guy as well. You know, they just sound like the Beatles. You know, they have that. Yeah. They yeah, even when, have when, when, of, when it switched from um, yeah. the uh, you know the Sergeant Pepper's bit to the yeah. When I'm 64 parody. Hmm. It's like they're doing a little Ringo, yeah. <laughs> a little Ringo voice. It's like, yeah, cool, man. You know, <laughs> there's even a song about <laughs> there's even a song about the little swamp creature that's in the um, the trash compactor. Is that the Octopus's Garden one? No, no, that's it. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's just <laughs> so good. I love this. This is my new favorite thing. And uh, just in time for Star Wars Day, which I'll be playing all day tomorrow. I'll just have this on a loop in my home office. I think your your poor Star wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, luckily she'll be at work, and I was just kind of like, but I'm just going to be anyone who has a meeting with me tomorrow. I'm sorry, you know. It's just like so. Yes, so that's so that's cool. It is Star Wars Day tomorrow. I'm sure. I think Nicola and I are either going to watch Rogue One again, or we're going to watch Force Awakens again because um, uh, I can't get her to watch Empire because she's watched that too many times. Um, but I might do that when she's gone to bed. But so Star Wars Day tomorrow, and then the only other thing was um, a little bit cool thing actually. Um, I got invited along to Sony PlayStation London. So I got oh, cool. invited along to PlayStation London on Friday because they have, uh, from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock, um, they have a subsidised bar. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Is that uh, why you got invited <laughs> along? Have they paid you? will go anywhere with a subsidised bar. <laughs> They're like, hold up. He, you know, Anthony likes beer and he likes <laughs> he likes PlayStation. Why don't you come along? So yeah, so basically just got uh, a friend of a friend is in the PMO um, at um, Sony PlayStation. So obviously I'm a programme manager. So we, it was like, oh, why don't you come along and, and we can have a chat. So we, I just went along and was just talking in very vague terms the people I was kind of conversing with it was very vague terms about what they're doing and what project they're actually PMOing um, I did get to go into the London PlayStation PMO Centre which was quite cool it is so branded everything is just PlayStation everywhere just, just a slight time out for those not in the know of organisational terms what does PMO stand for? Project Management Office thank you ah. <laughs> So yeah, so they saw. So Anthony they was, was just broadcasting this to his PMO friends. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's going to slip into just jargon at this point, and we'll fade yeah. out. Yeah, we were talking about PIDs, and we were talking about ROI, and it was just, oh, it was just all good fun. So yeah, so I was just like chatting away um, uh, about project management and stuff like that. It was really cool. There was there was lots of people there. Um, I did just want to go and sit kind of with anyone and go, right, what are you working on? <laughs> you know, they yeah. had a they had, they had um, PlayStation Four foosball table. Um, 
which was all oh, kind of it was a feasible table with a Sony logo in all of it, ping pong, and it was just really cool. It was a cool little area, so I was quite happy. I'm going back in a couple of weeks. I've been allowed to come back, so uh, so which was oh, really cool. Oh, you got yourself invited again? How did you do that? You smarmed your way in. Well, as I was hugging the person goodbye, I said, "Right, I'll see you in a couple of weeks." And she was like, "Okay, <laughs> okay." Oh yeah, you're like, "Where's your next free <laughs> bar?" <laughs> yeah. They were escorting you out of the door. <laughs> Don't let me go. I'm taking a prototype PlayStation Pro. They did have quite a lot of PlayStation Pros actually, kind of like on display where you could play a whole section of games. They were really cool. There was like these little pods um, with PlayStation 4 Pro and you could just kind of play those games there as well. Did you play a little game of sort of trying to be so charming that you charmed some information out of these guys that are trying to be vague? (laughs) Yes. I did get to see a project timeline, but that was it. Uh, but it was all very vague, just in case anyone like me had stumbled in there. And I got to come away with some PlayStation water. So it was all very cool. <laughs> <laughs> that it tastes of PlayStation This too. is amazing. So, so who's, who's your next platform holder that you're going to invade? Because it was Apple last week. It's Sony this week. Should, should yeah. I be putting a word for you to somewhere down south in the uh, Microsoft HQ? Yes, absolutely. Either that or I'm coming up <laughs> coming to Birmingham. <laughs> You'll see me waving with the up. goose. He wasn't really invited. There's a man at the gates. You do know about the traditional hobo. <laughs> you'll be going That's for your afternoon mean. run, James, and you'll just kind of see. I'll just suddenly start running alongside you. You're like, hello! And then just keep running. It's <laughs> alright. The, the angry goose at the end of our drive will keep you out at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Honk. So yeah, so that's my new hobby now to just kind of go take all these things off my bucket list. It's all good fun. Just to frequent um, publishers. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow! Um, they didn't have um, Sony branded beer, did they? That'd be pretty cool. No, they didn't. They had Brewdog, but the tables, like all of the tables, were just they had Horizon Zero Dawn all over the tables. Wow. So it's just like all the tables, like the kind of the the surface of the table was just a big screenshot from Horizon Zero Dawn. Oh, cool! And did the people seem really happy in their in their jobs? Did they seem stressed? Did they seem under it from all the work? Um, they, did they seem like they were mid crunch, or did they seem like they've just because they, they've got loads of stuff out and now they're relieved? They're, now they're relieved. No, it, it just was a really good vibe. It was a really good vibe, actually. It was really cool. They had they had pizzas. You know, you could order pizzas. There's food, beer, nachos. You know, and for for London, it was incredibly cheap as well. You know, it really was kind of a subsidised bar. Um, so which was really cool. It was really it was really good fun. Like I say, it was just branded like PlayStation everywhere. Um, but there was a really good vibe. There were lots of people, kind of lots of tables, lots of people, kind of chatting. I was I was incredibly tempted because I woke up, and we'll get to kind of what we've been playing um, a bit later. But I woke up on Friday morning, actually. I didn't go to bed until midnight on Friday, so midnight Thursday, Friday morning, um, because I wanted to download Mario Kart um, for my Switch because I knew I was going into London. And, you know, and you know, salute to the Nintendo Network because at midnight 02, Mario Kart disappeared from coming soon. I did a quick search for it. There it was, ready to buy. So I just bought it um, online, and then I just started to download, and I just shut the switch over and I just kind of smiled to myself and went to sleep um, <laughs> and then woke up in the morning and it was there it had downloaded so I was very tempted because throughout the day on Friday I'd actually had a couple of meetings there were a couple of kind of like stressful meetings there was a couple of meetings where I just went do you know what before we start this meeting let's have a go on Mario Kart you know and we kind of got took the controllers off put the little put the little kind of button thing on it um, the Joy-Con kind of uh, cover and then we just had a game of Mario Kart and it went down really well so so I was very tempted to do that, but I thought there was it might be a bit kind of arrogant of me or it might just be kind of to play a Nintendo at Sony PlayStation, you know. <laughs> I was like I was like, shall I? I was talking to the people I was with, I was like, shall I get it out? I've got Mario Kart and they were like, Oh, we're not sure. You know, yeah. there was just... Have you heard of this Vita thing? Because you, yeah. you could have taken that. You go, yes. Yeah, I've got this in the other pocket. Yeah, Little Big Planet <laughs> What was it, Little Big Planet Racing? There you go, that's the <laughs> There you yeah. go. There you so, go. They're all sighing because they're not allowed to play anything but that. And you're going, away. Hey. <laughs> I thought, oh, this would get people going. I can start talking to people because they'll all be like, coming, the, like surrounding me. But I thought I'd get turfed out by the PlayStation security guard or something. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it was a really good night. It was a really good night. Like I say, it was up until eight. And then I, I kind of came home via five guys. So which was really nice. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad. But you didn't get yourself a lanyard, it doesn't sound like. No, no. Yeah. I've got one though from Next EGX. Time. No, I've got one from EGX. Oh, you're all right. Yeah. So, 
I did have a I did have a visitor's pass, but unfortunately the security guard was quite quite vigilant, and he was like, "You haven't given your 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 uh, your <laughs> guest pass over." And I was like, "Oh, damn it!" <laughs> Chess and the hacker is waiting to revisit in the dark hours. It was just a paper one, but it would have gone nicely in my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. In the in the cabinet with the apple lanyard. Yes, absolutely. Lanyard. Which is now hanging on the back of my spare room door. Awesome. So, much, much so, so I have to, I have to ask before we before we move on though. So when you were looking at the um the, so the projects they were working on, is this like Sony HQ or are there actually devs there? There's actual devs there. Cool, because I, I I've often wondered how other studios like work in this fashion. Because you see it like GDC and bits and pieces, you get feedback on how others implement the design and like development process or so and mm-hmm. and each studio falls into their own sort of like set of processes i guess because everyone chooses what suits them mm-hmm. and like we basically run off post-it notes like i i know certain people sneer at the fact that, like post-it notes are a key part of certain development types but we absolutely adore post-it notes because it's just so easy to stick up tasks stick up like little yes. notes and bubbles and stuff on the board and just move them around and like tasks going through the the pipeline or whether it be ideas percolating Mm -hmm. how many post-it notes were at sony well it's quite interesting because the timeline that i saw was just this one long we have it at work as well where it's a whiteboard but it's just paper so you can buy it on amazon and you just basically can pepper a whole wall with this and it was basically just a long timeline but there there was there was few actually i thought i would see a board like um the you was describing because we actually use at work we use tfs for that microsoft's like team yep. foundation server for that rather than we've rather than post-its we, we do it that way but i was expecting to see that kind kind of board but instead it was a very long timeline of of deliverables and the deliverables were the post-it notes cool cool yeah can we use sort of like a hybrid i promise it'll get more interesting soon listeners um <laughs> yeah we've got everything like logged in tfs but then we use like the we with our faces on the noses on the coal face we just have like having the post-it so you don't have to log in and change stuff so it's uh yes we, yes our, our poor pms have to go in and sort of like log the changes once we've shifted our post-it notes <gasps> That's so awesome. That's really cool. I, I want to hear more about the post-it notes. Do you, do, you, do you try and be inventive with them, or are they just the box standard yellow ones that you just get, or do you, oh, do, do you bring in special oh, Darren, ones? Darren, different colours mean different things. How could yeah. you live uh, in such an organised world? Do you we, have, have we have stickers that get printed out on them. There's barcodes on the stickers. Oh, shut up. That's we are really going cool. deep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you have wipeable blown. post-it notes? Because we have wipeable post-it notes. Wipeable post-it notes? Yes. So you can actually kind of like, use them again. Like, what? This needs to be reported back. This reminds me, right, Anthony? Tell me if this is, has ever been, if this is available now, because I had an idea that I'd forgotten about, and you've just reminded me of it. My idea was for um, a post-it note pad, okay, but it was, um, yeah, what the way it worked was sort of. You remember those things that you draw on with with a stylus, and it's got sort of uh, iron filings in, <laughs> like an like an etch a sketch, yeah, yeah, right. like the ones and where so- you draw mustache on faces when you're five years old. Yeah, that kind That's of thing. The one, yeah. yeah, like a yeah. magna doodle or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's like that, but it's a post-it note. And there was there was a type like that, and it had a little sort of lever at the bottom, and you could like slide it from the left to right, and it it clear what was written on or the drawing. Yeah. Hold on, iron filings post. And my idea was for the post-it note. Yeah, that you draw on it, but then you could go whoosh, or shake it, or you pull the lever, and then it's blank again. I think so that it, was you know, it probably suits its purpose. banned in then, the 80s because it gave people lead poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a different... different. <laughs> no, but like I say, well, the, the ones that we have at work, we basically, they are wipeable. Like so they're just, they're just white and they're wipeable. White and wipeable. What, do yeah. you need to use a special like, no, dry just, marker or something? You can wipe them on your face. They, 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 so they wipe off. <laughs> we, should put, we should put timings in the show notes so people can skip past this. <laughs> If you want to skip the post, this is interesting know. stuff. This is I, I, I'm I fascinated as, as like as someone who likes process. I'm fascinated by this. <laughs> Maybe we should take it off air. Okay, yes. <laughs> for our special bonus podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm still confused. You can't write in Barrow on a post it and wipe it off, can you? Anyway, that and other questions will be asked. <laughs> yes, yeah. these are them. If you're we'll interested in, in the that. Lost Park yeah. PMO podcast <laughs> coming soon to iTunes, I can't wait. So, Daz, how's your week been? Yeah, not too bad. It's well, actually, it could have been better. I, I got myself a bad back on, <laughs> on like Thursday morning. Oh no! I got up and I was like, "Ow!" And then, like, sort of, I got up a bit more. I was like, "Ow!" Ah, uh, and uh, anyway, 
by Friday it got worse and it just got worse and worse till Saturday where it, like any movement I was like oh no man this is ridiculous I can't believe how much you use your back for everything and then I'd coughed it was like I'd fallen into the pits of hell oh, it was no. awful um, so I spent the, the bank holiday weekend for for the most part just sort of trying to recover I was doing a bit of stretching and, and just lying out so it was, it was a bit miserable but um, I'm still recovering now it's not perfect so I've got like I've had some paracetamol before I'm doing the pod, and I've got like a million cushions <laughs> propping me up. Um, but no. it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot better though. Um, right. But the so the other thing, apart from that, that's slightly bad news that I've had uh, was on Friday I braved braving my bad back. It hadn't sort of peaked by that time. Um, m- my son's school they had sort of a technology showcase for the older kids. Um, so the kids that are about, I think. Years, years five and six, which means that they were aged probably nine and ten. I think that I think that would be correct. So the nine and ten year olds, so the highest two years of juniors, um, and they had our local college go and do this technology showcase. But we got a letter home saying, after school, they're going to display some of these technologies in the hall, in the school hall, and you can bring a you, you know if you you can bring your uh, child to have a look if you're interested. So I thought, yeah, that sounds good. You know, Sam likes his technology, and so do I. So I thought, yeah, let's let's have a look and see what see what's going on. Um, so we went along anyway, and the college students were there demonstrating all different little things, which was which were interesting. Probably a little bit beyond the grasp of Sam. He's only six, but um, very interesting for me, and I'm sure very interesting for kids of an older age. You know, the the age that they were actually pitching it to. They were doing um, one. One of the things was a game on tablets, and they had, they had a stack of tablets, so like the children could grab hold of these tablets and play a game. That basically, this game was disguising the fundamentals of programming and instructions step by step, which is really cool. Wow. It was um, I can't remember. The, it was a character. I think it was a robot, and he was on an isometric grid made of blocks. And basically, so the first level would be like three blocks to a blue square, to a blue cube, or whatever, a blue space that you had to get to. Uh, so in order to do it, the guys say, look, you, then in, in another separate box, you had sort of forwards, left, right, down, rotate, uh, and then a light bulb, which meant you, that's what you pressed when you got to the square. So the guy would show you and he'd say, so here, we, we, you go forward, 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 uh, light bulb, and then you press go. And then the robot carries out the instructions. And obviously, as, the level, as you completed the levels, they got more complex. And then they kind of hit you with like, yeah, this is the fundamentals of programming. And I just thought it was a really good way to get the kids into it, really. Mm, you know, to give them an cool. explanation. It was it was really good, and you could the levels got complex. And Sam was because he's a bit of a gamer on the sly. He, he was he just took to it like a duck to water. He really enjoyed it, and I thought this is great because he doesn't realise that he's learning here. He's just enjoying the game, but he's he's getting these basics, these fundamentals of stacking um, instructions on top of each other to get to an end result. And I just thought it was class. And I think if we'd have had longer, and if you know, Sam will get to the age where he gets this probably one to one, they probably get to that. But we didn't see that for for, for long because we didn't have that long. They were they were all going soon. So we looked at that, and that was fantastic. Then we looked at another uh, a game that one of the students had made in I think it was Game Maker, um, and this was ba- he said. So I sat down with Sam, and Sam went, "Oh, I like the look of this game." And it was on a laptop, and he was controlling it with the cursor keys, and there were sort of cards falling down. And you had to get a penguin across from one side of the screen to another, uh, to the goal. It was very simple, a bit of, very simple platform game. And the guy started talking to me when he when he took his headphones off <laughs> and deemed to speak to me. Um, and he was like, yeah, mate. He goes, yeah, this is like game. It's like based on Hanafuda, you know what I mean, Hanafuda. And I like went, oh, yeah, what, you mean uh, the card game that Nintendo started up doing? And he was like, you what? <laughs> he couldn't believe I knew. So I was like, well, geeky now. I was like, yeah, you know, I... I'm a bit of a gamer on the sly. <laughs> and um, so we were having a bit of a chat. Well, but Sam, just with that one, he didn't really learn anything. He just liked the Penguin game. But, and this is the main event, guys, I just followed Sam to this thing, and I didn't really look around. And the guy said, over there, they've got some kind of virtual reality thing, if you want to have a look at it. I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Your so ears looked... prick up straight away, don't they? <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, wow, Pushing that's cool. Pushing kids out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> scattering them to the four winds as I kick them here and there. And I looked around thinking, well, they're not going to impress me much because I've got my vibe, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm safe, I'm not going to get excited. And then I got star starstruck because it was a HoloLens. Wow. And I was like, you got a HoloLens? 
Um, this guy didn't seem to know. I think he might have nodded his head. Anyway, I just went, come on, Sam. <laughs> Off we went. <laughs> and uh, I should have known because it was the only bit of the hall that had a bit of a weight. There was a bit of a queue of kids. And I was like, oh, plumbing out. And I was like, Sam, you've got to have a go on this. I said, this is this is awesome. I said, this is... I, and I, tried, I explained it to him in sort of kids' terms. Um, yeah. And I said, you're going to have to have a go on this. I said, it's like our vibe, little one. Um, and he, I was like, do you want to have a go? He's like, yeah. So we, we sat and waited. And while we were waiting, watched all the kids have a go and stuff. And I was thinking, this is really bad because I really want to go. <laughs> but it's it's not for the adults, I don't think. And I was like, so I, I started like chatting to the guy a little bit. I was like, oh, this is a HoloLens, isn't it? And he was like, oh, yeah, you, no, nobody, nobody else knows what this is called. I said, I've been following this story since it launched. I was really amazed by this and that. And he was like, yeah, what about when they dropped the Minecraft on the table on the announcement? I was like, yeah, man. So we were having a bit of a chat about it. And I like looked over the hall and saw the deputy headmistress sort of looking over and she was like smiling at us. And um, I sort of went, I sort of mouthed, please, can I have a go? <laughs> and then she sort of went, you'll have to ask the guy. And I was like, all right. I goes, could I, could I have a go, man, all right, after all the children? And he went, yeah, go on then. And I was like, yes, I was more excited than any of the kids. <laughs> so um, Sam had a go, and, and and he walked around, and I didn't have a clue what he was seeing, you know, I just because I had never used it before. So he had a go, and he came back, and this was a bit before I'd, I'd asked, actually, if I could have a go, and I was like, because there was still other children in the queue. And I, was, I just said to Sam, I said, what was it like? And he was like, yeah, it was really good, it was really good. Um, but trying to get off him <laughs> what happened was quite difficult. Um, he just said, it's cool. I said... I said, he said, I can see rocks and buildings and stuff. He said it was really good. He said there was a <laughs> robot that spoke to me. And I was like, okay, it doesn't really paint a great picture. It sounds like, like he's been had, given like, a secret message. Like, don't don't yeah. tell them. Yeah, don't yeah, tell yeah, them this. Don't tell that, the adults. <laughs> that's quite scary because i got no clue what he saw, what he saw in there. Um, yeah, and then when you put it on for an adult, it's something like different. So anyway, I got to have a go on HoloLens. And wow. it's really cool. Have, have, have any of you had a go yet? Yes. yes you've I had have. a go. To, you've had a go. Well, yep. the... the, the the one that I, the thing that I did, it was sort of exploring um, like some sort of Chilean uh, geographical space, um, some kind of Inca um, ruins or something like that. Oh, that yeah, I think I've been on that exact demo. Yes. Oh, brilliant! So, and I just I thought it was really good. I mean, I was prepared for the for the field of view, um, but apart from the field of view, I thought it worked really well. The headset didn't in real life didn't seem as big and bulky. As it does when I've seen it, people wearing it on YouTube. It was it was light, you know, and it, obviously with Hololens, it's got the computer built into the headset, so there's no tethering. Yeah, and it was really bright. It overlaid. I mean, we're in a pretty bright hall. The sunlight was shining through the windows. It was bright and clear. I could see um, the ruins and everything. And as, as I walked around, it was as if I was walking around it. And the sound was really clever as well because the sound came out of speakers through sort of the halo that you're wearing. You sort of put the halo on your head and tighten it up at the back, maybe. Maybe similar to PSVR, I'm not sure. Um, and the sound was really good, because it was as if the sound was really well balanced at being augmented as well, because I could hear the people in the room really well, but I could distinctly hear um, the instructions in the demo as well. Wow. And, yeah, it was really bright, except you could choose to see through it if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. And it was just a bit of an experience. It was very short. I mean, I, I felt guilty because another child turned up, and I was like, I was only in there two minutes, because as soon as I saw somebody <laughs> waiting, I was just kind of like, okay, that'll do. I've seen it. I'm happy, um, but yeah. So I got to have a go, an unexpected <laughs> go on Hololens just got, just at my son's school, and I was thrilled. And it, and it's 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 good, you know. It's it's probably not it's not a consumer item. They're not pitching it as a consumer item, and I, I wouldn't be wanting to spend two grand on it. But if you've got an opportunity to have a go, and it, as an indicator of where things may go in the future, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's it's just a different take on it, isn't it? It's like the VR is one thing, but it's it's a shit. I, I can't remember the um, that that sort of tourist uh, app specifically, but there are a couple of demos that I tried that were purely trying to overlay stuff in the room, like just literally augment it. So like aliens coming out of walls, and they they were the ones that I thought worked best because it was working with your surroundings rather than trying to project a whole new image over you. Oh wow, yeah, I bet that would be good. I mean, this yeah. was quite good, but you, because obviously you, you're seeing two things at once. You know, you can, you're seeing you, where you are and you're seeing the augmented thing. But it was quite good because you walked around and then it sort of had a signpost in CGI on a point of interest, and then it came up with inverted commas, uh, "Talk to me." So I said, "Talk to me," and then a lady launched into a description of the um, of the pyramid or, or whatever it was. 
similar to you know when when you go on these tours and you you, you grab some earphones and you walk around and it, and it tells you stuff and i just thought this is really cool you know the, 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 as we've hypothesized before that you could use one of these devices to walk around anywhere and get a history lesson or any lesson for anything mm. where, where where seeing it visually is an aid but yeah i didn't get to uh that that was the limit of it really i put it on my head walked around i was like oh wow it's really good it's really bright it's brighter than i thought it would be talk to me and then she went this the pyramid da, da, da. and then a kid came up and i went all right thanks a lot <laughs> <laughs> and that was it so i was in there for about two minutes but yeah it was a. Uh, it was so unexpected. I, in my wildest dreams, I didn't expect. As we stumped across the playground to go to the hall to look, check this technology thing out, mm. I had no idea that you were just expecting. Uh, Sam, we've got all this at home. We've got yeah. You know. It kind of was really. Can uh, we just go home? I want to play Persona. <laughs> I, yeah, and I was, I was proper blown away. And I said to the guy, I said, I can't believe you got a Hololens. And he says, Yeah, we we get all the kit. And he said that the guys are developing on it and stuff. And I was just like, wow. It, it, it made me quite proud of what, what what my local college is doing, you know, and made me think if that's a direction that Sam wants to go in, it's it seems like they're pretty on top of like of the tech. So, mm. yeah, I was, I was pretty impressed. Cool. That's fantastic. That's just so cool. Excellent. So going from that tech to this tech, so James, what have you been playing this week? Well, I've been playing the latest cutting edge of games. I've been playing Luigi's Mansion. Um, hey! <laughs> on Switch? Uh, no, no. I, I, people kept telling me when I... Because I originally just had an itching to, to go back to see Luigi's Mansion. Because I... And, Anyone who knows me knows I really like Luigi. He's like in my top three Nintendo characters like with, with the Goomba and um, uh, Kirby. And I just really had just this pang to put the GameCube back on and just wander around the mansion and start uh, hoovering up ghosts. And it got to the point where I've, I've now actually completed it, just about half an hour before we um, started recording, um, finished Luigi's Mansion for, pro- I think, the first time ever. I can't remember completing it, like, 15 years ago. Um, but it, it's still really good. And, like, as I told people at work I was playing this and, like, put it on Twitter a couple of times, and people were telling me there's rumours of a Switch virtual console featuring the GameCube at some point in time. So I might be able to play it in in high def at certain, uh, hopefully in some point in the future, because I was playing it through composites and I, I can hear you two visibly cringe at, uh, at, at that. <laughs> Hold up, that's not 4K. <laughs> no, so, it's barely 240i, if I'm, if I'm being honest, yeah. <laughs> so how was the... C- How's the control system? Do you think that would transfer quite well to the Switch? Like, because yeah. I, I think you know the virtual console. If the virtual console um, took on the GameCube, I would absolutely love that so much. So, as, as someone pointed out, like the the GameCube has got the best controller. I think mm. like those those meaty meaty triggers that you just like press down. There's that nice satisfying click when you get to mm. the bottom. Oh yeah. The Switch hasn't got that capability, so I'll be a bit. I, I don't know how exactly that would translate over because you've got all that play bit like accelerating your X wing or hoovering um, in, in Ghost or just accelerating in a normal car. There's that missing from the digital triggers that we've got on the Switch. Mm-hmm. So I'm not. I, I really don't know how they're going to do it. Like, I don't know what's going to happen after they get past the N64. Are they going to have to sell another controller? It's. Yeah, it, I'm. I'm unsure. Unsure with that. But um. Oh. It, it, I, Luigi's Mansion for me still holds up to this day because like that game is so full of character. Just mm. just Luigi himself just wandering around, humming his own theme tune, calling out his brother's name. <laughs> but then, then I, I actually that. started getting that's a button press, isn't it? You to yeah. call Mario, Mario, <laughs> Mario. Mario. <laughs> um, but then I w- I got a proper like just like big grin on my face when I got into the first set of rooms and started hoovering up ghosts and like casting shadows around my torch and hoovering up the the um uh, the bed sheets and the tablecloths because i can remember this selling me a gamecube way back when this was this was so next gen all these physics and materials it mm. was it was glorious so it's a proper little trip down uh, down memory lane for that wow you say you were playing it in composite and i remember that because i've got i've got a gamecube in storage and i get it out every so often to play a uh, rogue leader um great game but but there's an eight, there was an HD co- cable for it um, that came out, but it's like really hard to get hold of now, and it's worth loads of money. And, the, and I looked into it. I was like, "This is ridiculous. Why is it? Why is it so much money for this cable?" Because yeah. you can get the component cables cheap, and I've got components, so I can get it a little bit, you know, better than standard. It's better than SCAR, isn't it? Um, and you can activate the progressive scan, or you can on Rogue Leader. I don't know if Luigi's Mansion's got that, but there was a, there was a better cable for it. And the reason that this cable was so expensive and 
I was going to say that Nintendo stopped producing it so quickly, but <laughs> in <laughs> hindsight, that's kind of a habit. But um, it was because the cost of it was so much, because this cable, the GameCube couldn't actually do what the cable did on its own. So all the um, rendering of the uh, of the graphics into the higher quality yeah. were done through the cable itself. So yeah, it's got a little chip. Rendering. Yeah, it's got a chip in it that tries to up- upscale effectively. Yeah, so I I started looking for it, and I was like, oh, you can't get them, which made me want it. And then when I finally saw them on eBay, I was like, oh, I can't can't pay that. So I've had I've pulled it up quickly. It's £115. (laughs) Wow. And that's the lowest one. It goes up to about £320 if you want it boxed. My goodness I I didn't actually miss the clarity in some sense because i started actually looking down the route of like getting a frame meister and um yeah just like all sorts of mods rgb chipping and stuff like that and and the cost just goes up massively anytime you look down these these avenues and especially as you might need like a japanese or american gamecube to get the best out of it so that's a whole other cost on top of it yeah, because I was thinking, oh, I must be able, I must be able to just like make my own cable to do this. And as I started researching it and researching it, <laughs> what does the this end, cable like, look like? What does it look like? Is it kind it's of made like... of pure gold? <laughs> yeah, it's made of Nintendo magic. Now, what does it look like? Is it kind of uh, RGB? Is it? Oh no, it's just a component, right? But, but it, it does. But... It, it gets it higher res than the, the, the normal cable. And yeah. was it available at the time that the yeah, GameCube was for a available? Bit. For, yeah, for a while. Yeah. I might have one but in very storage. Scarce. <laughs> oh man, yeah. have a look. But you'll have to. We'll have to pass it round so we can all have yeah. a go with it. <laughs> I've got a whole box of cables with because I had an American. I had an American GameCube, um, and a whole. And at that point, I was kind of really you know, same as I at that point, same as I am now. Was like I always kind of went for those kind of upres and RGBs because I was plugging into a. Uh, I was plugging that and my original Xbox into a PC monitor. So in my then games room, it was a PC monitor, and I'm pretty sure I bought a special cable for the GameCube. Ooh, you should have a look. I know where I'm going on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah, we'll have to not forget that. It'd be so interesting if you got one. Mm. Holy grail of cables, that. Oh, honestly, I have yeah. a box of cables. So there's just like so many kind of cables for the GameCube and, and others. I've got a similar box. I've already ransacked it. <laughs> I've not got this cable. I, when I was looking, I was so frustrated. I started digging out all the cables thinking I could splice them together, um, but, but to no avail. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention, though, was you mentioned Luigi's Mansion. It's a game I haven't really played at all, actually. I don't think okay. I, ever, I didn't get it on my GameCube. Um, but I was going to say that would be a great game for VR. PSVR or yes. whatever, because of the way yeah. you shine the torch around. I mean, it's not mm. going to come out on those. But if Nintendo did some kind of virtual reality thing, which I've heard rumours about, I don't know, you know, sticking that screen in a, in a headset, I don't know. But anyway, what that would be a great foray into into VR, wouldn't it? Luigi's Mansion using the using the controllers as torches. I, I think it would actually be scarier, and so I, I guess it's always going to be scary. very scary. I think it'd be really scary. I don't, it just completely subvert what a nice little game it is at this point in time, where <laughs> it's all it like colourful and cartoony, evil. and like, oh, look at Luigi, he's scared out of his wits. But then you're in his shoes, and the ghosts only appear when you're not looking at them. It's like, oh, it's yeah. not quite the family-friendly fun atmosphere. It would be a very interesting dark twist on it, I think. Just thinking of that gives me the creeps. To think of a boo behind me now because I'm not looking that way. It's kind of like, ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but yeah, um, apart from that, um, I, th- I think I'm actually going to go into Mario Sunshine next. But um, ap- apart from my GameCube foray, uh, it's basically been Mario Kart 8 uh, since it came out last Friday. And it's it's good. It's really good. I mean, I thought Mario Kart 8 on the Wii U was probably one of the best Mario Karts that's been there. I still think the SNES one is my favourite, but I think Mario Kart 8 is the best. And now they've put the DLC tracks in there as well. It's made it a far a far easier prospect for me to rebuy it, because I can get the DLC on the Wii U. So the fact that they've included 16 extra tracks now is, is super. <clears throat> that's, yeah, that's really good. I mean, Wii, Mario Kart 8 is the reason I bought a Wii U. That was the pull. Yeah. Yeah, it was that, so it's, it's, Zelda was one tipping point, but then Mario Kart was uh, was there on the seesaw with it. Oh, what for for the Wii U? Oh, for the Wii U. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was saying that Mario. I I, I resisted a Wii U, and then Mario Kart Eight uh, came along, um, and that got me to buy a Wii U. And so it seems that it's just having 
just as great an effect. Yep. If not more on the on the Switch, and it's got it's got everything that the Wii U version had. Obviously, yeah. It's got all the DLC, but the thing is that they fixed the battle mode as well. Yeah, the the battle the battle mode is is really good because um, the, the Wii U version of Mario Kart it was pretty much just going around the tracks and hoping that you could do enough uh, handbrake turns to fire shells at them. But the fact they brought back proper battle mode maps from the previous ones has has just turned it into a proper viable online system now oh great because the battle mode before was just around the track wasn't it yeah yeah it, it just didn't work Which, it just yeah, didn't you work need an arena it it was weird it always felt like they just ran out of time with that one um so the fact that there's they've spent the time and polishing and i think if you there's a few people at work we've been talking back and forth about whether to get it because I think to all different extents, we have different tolerance levels for being resold stuff by Nintendo. Because that mm. seems to be a great marketing strategy they've got. And hey, it's, great it's working for them. And hey, enough people buy it, so it can't be that wrong. Um, so I think I was happier to do it because I didn't really play the battle mode and I didn't have the DLC. But a few people who went all in previously went, is, is a square remake of a SNES battle mode map enough? But then we played it online and yeah, yeah, it is. Because um, I, I was... Well, I wasn't gutted. I like lunch times. I, I usually have a set of things to do. Like today, I was um, like playing music with uh, my friend up in the music room, and downstairs they were trying to get like eight people attached on local Wi-Fi for for Mario Kart, and you could pretty much hear them over my drums at certain points. I swear the the hooping and hollering was enough for that. <laughs> um, the cursing. The cur- yeah, the cursing especially yeah. Um, so as well as people at work playing it local multiplayer, um, we we actually got a chance to play online multiplayer on Sunday, didn't we, Anthony? Oh, that was just so much fun. That was, was just great. so much fun on Sunday. Because at one point, I think there were six of us, was there? And we just uh, were just doing like Grand Prix, changing mm-hmm. up the, um, the different speeds, changing up what weapons we had, did a bit of battle mode. And I th- every, everything was just amazing. And, it, and it's, <laughs> wow. I think it's too easy to wax lyrical about these Nintendo games that have been around forever because people just think it's the legacy that sees it through. But I honestly think that Mario Kart has got such an accessible like set of fun mechanics I, mm. Ali who hasn't played a Mario Kart for generations played it for a bit before we jumped on and she was she was sliding around in no time I think Nicola who hadn't played it since the previous one she was she was winning races with it like th- the best part about Sunday was Anthony giving his wife advice for the first half an hour maybe an hour uh. and then her kicking his ass for the rest of the session <laughs> that is so funny <laughs> Was like, what have you got to say one? for yourself, Anthony? Oh, it was terrible, honestly. It was like I'm like, are you sliding around the corner? She goes, yes, I'm sliding around the corner. She gets very angry when she was playing. <laughs> it was oh. great because we and because you know, the Switch hasn't got like a chat system. We'd set up an Xbox Live chat so we could or talk. But um, Nicola decides to head um, keep the headset off, and we could just hear in the distance like, I'm doing it. <laughs> It was hilarious because I said to her, I said, oh, would you want to join the party? She goes, I'm, there. I'm only going to play for one. I think we ended up playing for about two and a half hours. Yeah, oh, yeah. Brilliant. And the entire time, you know, I was... Because the great thing was, was obviously I had headphones on, so I probably couldn't hear her as loud as you guys was. But my God, she was giving me some abuse. So I was on the big TV <laughs> and she was she was in handheld mode. So she was in handheld mode, playing in handheld mode. Oh my God, she was swearing. <laughs> it was just... Wow, we've, we've got to get you on a chat with Nicola in the same way on Overcooked. Oh God, no, no! <laughs> That's just dangerous. But it was oh, it was just so much fun. It was really good. You know, what I did find um, when we were playing it online was a James is just awesome, and and the person to beat. You know, I've been playing a lot, um, trying to, to to kind of up my up my game a little bit um james i need you to put some ghosts up there so i can see if i can beat them, <laughs> beat them. Um, so i'm ready uh, i've got a montage a training montage i was playing it on the train on my lengthy commute and i um i i three starred all but one of the 100 cc grand prix and so now i'm going to go up to 150 um but what I did find was that I am kind of on a par with friend of the show Manny, so he's now. So I'll play with him any time because we were getting kind of the same scores a lot of the time, weren't we? And a lot of the um, yeah, you, t- you tied in quite a few of the championships. So, so it was kind of, you know James about ten, twenty points in front of everyone else, but it was it was good fun. It was so much fun. It doesn't yeah. matter if you win. Um, I'm saying that because I was a loser. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> doesn't matter if you win. Because I'm a giant loser. It didn't matter if you win. It was a take a bite, but it was just so much fun. I've just never laughed like that that much. You know, it was quite That's nice to have a couple of beers. It was just absolutely hilarious. But there, there was just some beautifully like cinematic moments, I think, throughout it all. Because uh, hopefully everyone knows Mario Kart. Like, if, if you get dragged back into the pack... Like in amongst all the other rest of the races, and there's just shells and bananas flying like Billyo at that point in time, mm. and so you just hear the cries of people. Like I think Nicola at one point like was second, and then eventually got dragged down to seventh. And boy, did we hear about it! Um, <laughs> but my my favourite part. I mean, long story short, I won that race in the end, so we'll get we'll gloss over that. But. Manny was like right behind me and he just red shelled me about probably about 30 40 foot from the line and I just spun to his hole and I was just oh damn you Manny and I just saw him fly <laughs> over my shoulder because it was just after a jump and he was literally about just like going over head height just to my right and then just karma came back and smacked him in the rear because Nicola had unleashed another red shell. <laughs> and so you just see him him drop only about 10, 20 feet from the line or so. And just like cackling from her, cackling from me. It's, it's, there are better racing games, but I would definitely say there are very few more fun racing games than that because it just try the amount of equalizers that are in there, the amount of just light hearted shenanigans you can pull on it is superb. Yes. I was, I was seeing that action. Playing out as you described it, it was awesome. <laughs> I think one of the, one of the best things about Sunday night was we were doing two hundred cc. Um, oh so and we got to kind of everybody gets to choose a course. So there was at that point there was four of us, um, and everybody gets to choose a course, and it randomly selects it. So of course. James then brings in Ali into the into the what course would you like? Which and then Ali chooses Rainbow Road. So we and, and then <laughs> she doesn't know, bless her. <laughs> such a nice name for such a and vicious fun. track. And then so did the Nintendo Switch. It chose Rainbow Road. Mario Kart chose Rainbow Road. So we had to do 200 CC. And if anyone's played 200 CC, you'll know you go like the clappers. You have to so, actually break. Yes. Well. I had to like take my finger off the accelerator. So we were like 200cc uh, Rainbow Road, and I was just off all the time. The amount of times I got saved, it was just incredible. But it was so much fun. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, same again, Sundown. We'll, we'll, mm. we'll reserve a slot for you, Darren, when it comes your birthday, hopefully, if you can. You know, if the this is what I'm worried about. You. <laughs> You're all going to be off it. It's going to be, but I mean, you know, you could. You, I, I always used to play Mario Kart uh, on Mario Kart Eight on the Wii U. I I did play very often. Whenever I had friends around, we'd we'd, we'd fire it up and we'd have four player, and it was always a riot. Yeah. Um, but so, but, but a little bit part of me thinks, you know, you'll have had th- you'll have had four weeks of this, and not 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 only is there a possibility that you can be bored of it, but if you're not bored of it. Oh my goodness, you're all going to be so good. Oh, <laughs> I'm just going to be a laughing stock. I don't know any of the shortcuts. We're going to switch to Forza for its Hot Wheels any second now, and then, uh, yeah. You know, well, you'll yeah. get a chance what, to catch what, when I <laughs> You'll switch when I get it. <laughs> I'll be like, oh, I've got Mario Kart guys. I'll be like, yeah, we're on Hot oh, Wheels. Oh, we traded now, it so in. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. so, so we've got Forza yeah. next week. So Forza comes out next Tuesday, doesn't it? So we've got kind of like that, and then we'll be back on the on the Mario Kart. But I can't wait for you to join in, does because it, it'll be it'll be funny. You know, I, I think we should even start bolstering the numbers. You know, we, uh, we can get Ali in. We can get Manny's other half. You know, we can get Claire. Yeah. With the, I'm going to get Claire because she doesn't like the race. Racing games, but the brilliant thing I'm going to get her with the, with uh, Mario Kart on the Switch is you've got that uh, steer assist, haven't you? And you can't go off the, you can yeah. apply it so you don't yeah. you don't go off the side. Yeah, and I think she'll she'll be happy with that. Oh, that that caught me out. That's on by default. Yes. Yeah, I heard about that. And, and you're so thinking, that, why can't I go down there and it rests the control away? From yeah. You? So I, th- I think it was the first or second course. I was trying to take a shortcut, and it was just wrestling me back on. I was literally driving perpendicular, just like driving off the course in a straight line. Nope just bounces me back on it which i think is great because it's also got um an auto accelerate ah. so effectively you can give it to small children and they'll no matter what they do they'll be going round and they'll be steering but if they sp- steer badly then at least they'll still be on the course so i think it's a mm. nice nice addition i just wish they flagged it up to begin with yeah it shouldn't be on by default i think it should say yeah put this on if you you know or even if you start crashing a lot it says did you know you could do this yeah um but it's very very it's a very inclusive option Mm. Really nice. Yeah, you know, it's really good. I mean, I, you know, I've been playing. Like I say, I've been playing it kind of um, one player. Um, Nicola and I, we've been playing it two player. We did. We had a go on Monday, um, and I did find that because 
what what we were trying to do was we were trying to do the Grand Prix. So what we've done in other uh, Mario Karts before, we were trying to go through and just basically three star all of the races. But what we found was we couldn't actually do that with two either local or multiplayer you can't do that the only the only option that's available to you is either pick four race pick four courses or battle mode so we had to split screen so we just basically we went off of um like nicholas we we docked nicholas switch and we just went off that and then so i had to switch to that little kind of dog controller um which was like i felt like i was gonna break it with my hands you know playing mario kart <laughs> it's like it's it's nice it works well but i was just like i i need a pro controller i need another pro and nicholas was like you're not having mine she's got tiny little hands but yet she wouldn't bequeath the pro controller to me <laughs> so, so, outrageous i know so she was just like so i was like right i'm gonna order myself another one but they are actually out of stock at the moment they're quite hard to get hold of i want to get the, the two wheel set for the joy cons why i'm really would you excited do that? about it why would you do it. that james actually think... switched james switched to um uh, to motion controls did you still win though james i might have done yeah i think yeah. you did <laughs> I, I think I found it very, on the wii i found it really good with the wheel i've not played the wheel with the wii u but on the yeah. wii i thought it worked really well Right. I, I could imagine it working better because, like, if because actually because when Ali and I played split screen as well, actually holding the Joy Cons for an extended period of time, mm. it's just really uncomfortable because the fiddly. amount of pressure. It's, it's more the amount of pressure that you're applying to it. It's just not ergonomic oh, wow. when you're holding down A to to accelerate and then trying to slide and also holding like a banana behind you at the same time. It's just not. It's not mm. enough space for your fingers to operate. But I can remember when we played Mario Kart 7, I think it was on the... Or maybe it was a Mario Kart DS. I got the wheel accessory for my DS just to make the DS more ergonomic to hold. And that was that worked wonders. So I can imagine buying the wheel for the Joy-Con just makes it easier to play with that tiny controller. Mm. Yeah, I just really like the idea that me and Sam will be somewhere in the car or whatever, uh, or waiting for this or that. And we'll just get out the switch, and then we'll get out, detach the Joy Cons, put them in the wheels, and we'll be set. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> uh, That's just so cool. I mean, I must admit, though, on Friday, um, I kind of I had um, I downloaded Mario Kart for Friday before I left for work. So I left for work. I think I got up about five. I was I was in work for like seven fifteen, and it was really cool because I was getting had my coffee, did the stuff that I needed to do before I jumped into an eight o'clock meeting. But before we started the eight o'clock meeting, I was like, I've got to show you this, and we have to play Mario Kart. So I just kind of like, <laughs> so got it. Every, I was like, every meeting with Anthony starts with Mario. Absolutely, I had two meetings on Friday, and like two of the meetings that I had on Friday, both of them, there were the two meetings that started with Mario Kart. So I was like an advert. I just popped them off the side, put the little kind of little grips on, and then put the uh, stand out, and we just sit, sat there and just played Mario Kart. And it really does, it lifts, especially kind of if it's like uh, not a ten meeting but it just it's you know there's there's lots to be done and it's quite it's quite stressful it's really good way to just alleviate that stress quite quick and it's just so much fun it was really cool i was like yeah i like this so we were sitting in our little kind of glass meeting room kind of no one else was around in the office because people don't really come in until like half eight nine um and it was just so cool just to kind of sit there and just kind of play a couple of games of mario kart it was just it was awesome i love it it's good it's good um, so the final thing that I've been playing is Human Resource Machine. So it's, yeah. it's strange that you um, raise the topic of games that do programming, uh, Daz, um, because this is pretty much what Human Resource Machine is. It's one of the indie titles that's available on Switch, and uh-huh. it's from the same people who did World of Goo um, oh. and Tiny Inferno. So I think mm-hmm. it's been out for years. Um, yeah, I've got I've got it on Steam. I haven't yeah. played it yet. It it is programming. Is is the best way to describe it because you're um it's a top down view, mm-hmm. and you're a tiny man that walks into an office, and you're basically given the job of trying to sort an inbox to an outbox to a certain specification. So you get numbers or letters that come in on the inbox, and you have to arrange them in a grid that's in the middle of the room, perform some sort of operation on them, and then shift a specific answer out to the other side. And it's a real stealth way of introducing programming concepts like ifs or loops or sorts. Um, and it just really scratched an itch. Because although I do that for a nine to five, <laughs> just I, I really love problem solving. Honestly, mm. we, I'm, I was at a careers fair um, last week and the one drum I kept beating was like, if you like problem solving, then game development is for you. 
and and this was just yeah scratching that itch like how do i do it in this very simplified programming language how do i alphabetize this how do i divide it by a hundred and it was it's just a really nice set of puzzles that would scratch that part of uh, the brain that like you like like sudoku or or crosswords um so i think it's only like eight eight nine quid or something like that and if you are at all interested in stuff like that i do recommend it i mean it's not that flashy to look at there's not much more to say but it's got a good foundation if you want to know what boolean operations are wow Mm. that sounds really cool that sounds like something i should be downloading for uh, nicola's switch i think that sounds right up her alley you know it's kept me quiet for hours i swear (laughs) (laughs) oh that's good if it keeps her quiet though i think she'll love that i think because you're right that kind of I mean, she 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 programs kind of. She, she is a developer at work, so you know it it is kind of like you say. You kind of do that in the day job, and then you kind of come over to it. But you know, I think that would kind of that's that kind of seems to kind of would would appeal to her the way her brain works. Yeah. Next time she's beating you on Mario Kart, you can <laughs> just wave that in front of her and try and distract her from, from Quick, beating go you. Go optimize this. <laughs> I was like, are you jumping on the corners? Yes, I'm jumping on the corners. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd heard that. It sounds so funny. Oh, it was absolutely it was hilarious. It was hilarious. Daz, what have you been playing, sir? Me? Not a lot's changed. <laughs> because I'm playing two epic games. Mm. Um, so I'm still playing Zelda. I don't know how many hours I've played Zelda for, but I'm still playing Zelda. So your Joy-Con's back? My Joy-Con's back? Oh, I got yeah. back like, last week. I don't know. No, you're still anyway. Persona Ring, yeah. Yeah, so the Joy-Con's back. So I've been playing Zelda. I've been playing Persona 2. And it was kind of good that the Joy-Con went away because, as I said, you know, that made me invest more time into Persona and it got me hooked, um, which is fantastic. Um, but I have been having a little bit of a sly go on Zelda as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Zelda, I'm just loving it. You know, I'm still finding little tasks to do. I found a dark forest um, where it gave me a little challenge uh, of finding the shrine within it. Yep. Awesome. Um, so another little adventure, you know, within the game. I love that sort of thing. So just wandering around. My, my game at the moment, I'm wandering around looking for shrines and that's really it um looking for shrines and just looking just looking what is over the next hill mm. ad infinitum because i just see things whoa there's a, last night or uh, if it wasn't last night the night before i saw i got to a shrine and then there was a rock face in the distance sort of red rocks you know sort of like look, look like motor storm on ps2 ps3 sorry um that sort of canyon-esque red, you know, like the Arizona red rock desert thing. Um, and on the side of the cliff face, there was a symbol, a sort of like well, some lightning and mm. um, like, like birds. And I instantly just thought, I need to go and have a look at that. <laughs> um, but then I put the pad down because I was like, that's for next time. And I put, But that's another thing about it. I love how you just put it into sleep and you just instantly carry on, mm. Where, whether it be on the TV or out and about. You know, you just that that instant resume. I know it's been around for a while, but I just I just really like it on the Switch. You know, there's, you just press that button and it's just instant. It's like it's just been in sleep, which it has. It's sleep mode, isn't it? But mm. the battery holds up in sleep mode really well. Um, so yeah, that's Zelda. I'm just I'm just loving it. I don't think there's much more to say. So just, how many shrines have you? Anymore. How many shrines have you unlocked so far? I'm not sure. Thirty. All oh, right. Okay. Maybe more. I don't know. Sound um, a bit more impressed, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, got, no, I thought uh, when you were saying you were looking for shrines, I was like, oh my God, he's going to. Because I think Nicola's at 74 shrines. Oh, right that's now. good. Because I, I was worrying because I, I, I don't know how many shrines there are. Do you, and do I you was want thinking, to know? What, what if there's only 50? No, no. There's do you want to know how many there are? 120. Yeah. yeah. Is there? Yeah. Oh, demon. Though I, I sometimes think it's a cop out on a shrine where it, it's fair enough, but sometimes, you, like in the forest one that I just mentioned, you get to the shrine and it sort of said, Your task is already done. Just by accessing the shrine, that was the task. Yeah, but that's and a quest. Like, that's a shrine yeah, that's the, quest, isn't it? So yeah, you, yeah. But I'm sort of like, Oh, I want a puzzle as well. <laughs> I, want, I, want a, I want a puzzle in it. I don't just want to walk through and get a spirit orb. I want you to confound me with, with something fun. Um, and I love it. And I was doing the shrine, I think this was last night. And I walked in this shrine and I said, oh, brilliant, Claire. I said, I love this one because I haven't got a clue what to do. I said, I'm looking around and I don't know what to do. Mm. This is going to take a little while of figuring out. I said, I love it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just, and I figured it out eventually. And I was like, that's just great. I just love it. Because mm. uh, that, yeah, it wasn't obvious. So, yeah, really loving Zelda. It's just it's just brilliant. I've done two Divine Beasts. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit reticent to... Mm. I, I, I'm... 
I'm in the sort of the Birdman village now. Is it Rito? Mm-hmm. Rito. And th- I've just arrived there last night before I turned it off. Um, and I saw the the Divine Beast, and I was kind of like, ah, oh, but if I do that one, there'll only be one left. And, I d- I, and, and now I am conflicted. I'm thinking, should I do it? Like, the, the natural thing for me usually would be to just do it. But it's so much fun doing the other stuff, and because I don't want it to end. I'm but thinking of ignoring the Divine Beast and just pottering about some I, more. I guess it, it won't harm you to do it either way. That's that's the beautiful thing I found with this Zelda, is that it's so open. It mm. doesn't punish you from not doing it. Oh, I mean, or you get all your toys up front, which is glorious. You know, like in normal Metroidvanias, you think that something's going to be gated. You think that you need to unlock something new to get somewhere. But mm. it's not the case in this one. So yeah, don't don't do it if you don't want to. I mean, but, you, I, but you've seen what happens when you finish the other um, divine mm. beasts. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. So you, you, know, just, you, you get happens. something. So yeah, it's it's whether you want ask, that. I was going to ask you guys because I've just as well got enough hearts to get something. Yes, which was cool. Um, <laughs> probably the minimum amount actually that you need to get it. But you have thirteen I, I wanna, hearts then. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Half, we, half the listeners are playing Zelda. Go. I know exactly what you're talking about. The other half can be like, "What? <laughs> what, what mystery is this?" Yeah, because like Sam um, saw saw it, and then we he just we were just kept trying. But anyway, um, so I was going to ask you guys because of the advent of that mm-hmm. particular thing. Um, I uh, but what you just said, James, about uh, you can do anything in the game. Yep. You know, whenever you want, really. Would it be possible, as people have said, that you could do that right from the start, if you were skillful skillful enough, could you rush over to Hyrule and and complete the game? Yeah, yeah, you could do absolutely. Yep. Wow, flipping it! Wow. I think, I, I, think was thinking, I was thinking maybe there has that was been people on a certain podcast that have done that, that have actually just they've just kind of gone and they've they've tried it and they've done it. I think IGN uh, reported that they did it as well. Wow! Oh man. I don't know if I like that or not, because I think Far Cry had a thing like that, where Far Cry 3, I think it was, and right at the start, he sort of said, do something, and if you didn't do it, it just sort of was like, right. Oh, that's it, that's you it. yeah, you, could, you could complete the game in the first four minutes, couldn't you? Or some, I, I yeah. never played it, but you could just turn around and shoot the, the bad guy who was giving you a monologue. <laughs> Is that what you did? I think <laughs> so, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. That would solve uh, so nice many movies choice. and games, wouldn't it? If just when they were monologuing, you just shot them right at the start. Yeah. So that was like, right, Tom, <laughs> credits. Th- yeah, let me just explain this plan to you, Mr. Bond. <laughs> He's like, you're gone. Um, but, yeah, I, I love it. So that's good. I'll, I'll probably do the Divine Beast and then pottering around. But, uh, yeah, just just loving it. So I'm also playing Persona. Um, I'm up to 55 hours now in the adventure. And it still doesn't th- feel like it's anywhere near coming to a close. Right. Um it's a really beautiful bit in it, actually. The latest character to, to join my party. She is a character that has had issues. Um, and she becomes very um, very much a shut-in. She shuts herself in a room and she just like, ne- has never come out because of, because of mental issues um, caused by this and that that I won't go into. And you befriend her and part of the part of the game then I mean some people might think this sounds boring but it, it works well because it's a story based game and you all take it in turns because you're all you're friends your existing party you're all friends and you all decide that she needs help and you all take it in turns to take her out and try and get her over her agoraphobia get her over her uh, introvert introversions um, and you all take time to, to, to be with her to coax her out slowly and to, to befriend her and, and teach her trust and stuff. And it's just so sweet. Just so sweet. And it's just a great game for watching these these characters develop. It's just really cool. And this is how good I'd say it to you that it is. On, I think it might have been Saturday night, um, I said to Claire, what do you want to do? She said, play Persona. She said, so play Persona. I want to watch it. I've been looking forward to it all day. Cool. And so that's what we did. <laughs> Played it like all night. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just a great it's a great story. The the battles in it are, are, are fantastic, but it's driven by the story and then the connections between these these teenage friends and the fact that they're all to a greater or lesser degree they've all had something in their life that's that's gone wrong and that's what brought that's brought them together. 
and uh, I mean, don't get me wrong; it's not it's not life is strange, <laughs> you know? but it's 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 really good and heartwarming, and it's 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 just really good. It's got humour, it's got um, it's got style, as we already know, and it's just it's just a real pleasure to play. So I'm really enjoying it. I, th- I believe that the, you play the game for a school year, and I'm in August, so I suppose I'm I'm over the over the hump. So we'll, we'll we'll see what happens, but sort of the main the main story is still back. In, it really in the shadows, in the background of the story. Like you can tell something's there, and it's been alluded to, but it's by no means being brought to the forefront yet. And that's fifty five hours in, but it's been great fun from the from the start. It's been fun, and it hasn't felt like you know you just kind of grind towards a certain bit. Every bit of it's been engaging. So really loving Persona. Um, and Sexy Brutal, still playing that, mentioned it last week, still enjoying it. Um, I've solved another couple of cases, I mean you call them cases, but another couple of murders in the mansion, in the in the casino, the Sexy Brutal, and they've been very enjoyable to do as well. But the thing with that game is it's it's a joy to play, but you can't really say, I mean that's the worst, this is one of the worst ones, you can't say anything, because it'll just ruin it. But um, it's, And it's sort of the same thing for each thing. I followed the protagonists around, well, not the protagonists, I followed the the victims around, um, listened, hid in closets, spied through the keyhole, listened to what they were saying, watched the whole gory business play out, and then stroked my beard, hmm, so how are we going to solve this one? <laughs> where, d- where did that murderer go when this happened? So then, restart the day, and try and think where the murderer came from to get into that room so you listen you can see the footsteps trace it back trace it back trace it back see what he did then it's like okay then explore around see if there's any items things of interest and then examine objects in the rooms and then it's kind of like ah so if I tried that I wonder if that would scupper the plan and it's so exciting and uh, satisfying when it does and I had success twice with that um in the last few days, which has been really good. So that's that's really good fun. The only thing that concerns me with this is, I think there's only two more murders to to solve, or to save the victims from. So I'm not sure what, because I've not played it, I've not completed it, not played it before, haven't read any walkthroughs, so it, I'm not sure about whether it carries on past that or not, but I would imagine I'll have, I'll have solved some more by next week, so I'll keep you posted. But yeah, very enjoyable game, and a complete change of pace yeah, from the likes of you know, Zelda or Mario Kart or anything like that. It's very much a, a slow and steady game. Mm. From, from what you were saying last week, I've, it's basically on mine and Ali's radar now. So I, I think in between um, Mario Kart and Snipperclips, we might be trying to trying to sneak this one in to, uh, to uh, have You a should dabble. do, because you can work collaboratively from the couch yeah. and piece it all together. It's a bit, when you first start, it's a little bit confusing because, I don't, well, for me it was. I'd never played anything like it. And because it's a bit slow and we're used to racing around in like Zelda or Horizon Zero Dawn or Mario Kart or all these other games. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but it's worth it. Yeah. It's really worth it. So, yeah, and then it's it's just good. And when you, you sort of think, hmm, and then you go, that's the solution. And then you go and do it. And then once you've, once you've done that key event, once you've linked th- those things together, the game takes over and shows you what happened because you've already seen the murder. Oh, it's really cool. Yeah, it's great. So, yeah, that that that's me. Fantastic. Superb. That sounds good. I was very close to getting it, actually, at the weekend when I was kind of uh, stuck for some things to play, you know, because I was like, do, shall I jump in? And I was very kind of, I was toying with kind of doing it, but instead I kind of had is a... Is there a Switch version? Yeah. Is there a Switch version no, coming? No, I don't... Yeah, there is a Switch version coming. Um, so I think we had a look last week, and I think there is definitely... It was announced that there was a Switch version coming, that's but right. it's not yeah. out yeah. yet. So that'd be quite interesting, but that'd be quite cool to play again. That'd be quite cool to play on the train and kind of on the go. Yeah, it's really good. It's anywhere, you know. It's it's a great game. I'm really enjoying it. So that just leaves uh, Anthony you for what you've been playing. Yeah, me. Well, obviously Mario Kart Eight, lot of that. But um, after the pod last week, I jumped into uh, Rot Remains of Edith Finch. So I kind of uh, just kind of went back into that and, and continued playing. Um, little did I know, I only had about half an hour left to go. Um, it's not it's not a long game, um, but my God, it's an amazing game. Um, so I, I went through the kind of last kind of half an hour of that and kind of finished and finished that game, and I was just. I, I, you know, I think I said it all last week, but it was just such a, a really good experience. One of the things that I really liked was 
when you get to the next person and you start reading about that, the next Finch, it's just a different style. There was one that was actually like a comic book style, and it's just really cool. It was almost like you jumped into a page of a comic book, and it was just so. I just really enjoyed this game. Like I say, it's very, it's very kind of. It's a walk 'em up. It's in the same vein as um, Gone Home and Firewatch and things like that. But it just really is. You're just kind of being. You're just walking around the Finch house, which is kind of a character in its own um, in this game, and you're just kind of walking around the Finch house and just kind of unlocking kind of how each of these, how each of these Finches kind of uh, met their end. And it's just such a, it's such an engaging story and really interesting story. Cool. Yeah, it's, it sounds really good. I'm, I'm very interested. It's just, it's just finding time, isn't it? It really is. It really is. So that's kind of, so that was kind of what remains of Edith Finch, and then also um, Walking Dead, Walking Dead: New Frontier, episode four um, came out. So they've kind of put three and four have almost been back to back because I played three. I think three may have been out for a while, but I was too busy zeldering. Um, but uh, but episode four is out, so I kind of went through episode four. Um, some people were actually saying that this was having the kind of telltale episode four curse, but I really enjoyed it. I thought this was really good, and it's really it's put you kind of like really waiting for that final episode. So they always kind of have five episodes, apart from Minecraft. I think they had more, um, but this is kind of this is that this is the penultimate episode of what's been. You know, it's been a good run. It's not it's not as good as Walking Dead, the original one, but it's definitely it's definitely a good one. Um, and I mean, and I'm really enjoying it. Like I say, and after this one, I was like, oh, when it finished, I was like, no, I can't believe you finished there. <laughs> um, so it was quite a nice kind of cliffhanger, and it's got me kind of waiting um, for episode five. Which which I don't know. Um, I don't know when um, when episode five is coming out, but I hope it's soon because it is just so good. And I do just want to kind of finish the story off. But uh, but yeah, so that's kind of what uh, what I've been playing. Excellent. So yeah, they really enjoyed, really good. So uh, that's kind of what I've been playing. So let's jump into the news section. Um, and in this week's news section, the Switch Corner um, has been turned into the Switch Annex because we are packed with Nintendo news. Um, Wipeout goes gold, and Remedy announce a new project. Is this kind of like a retro gaming podcast? It's like, it's like <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that's the first piece of news is with you. It is. So, before we get into the Nintendo news, I just wanted to, uh, I suppose, blow the Persona horn a little bit more, because it turns out that the soundtrack for Persona 5 is being released on vinyl. Now, I'm probably a bit out of touch, but it seems vinyl's making a massive comeback, and people are really loving the fact that vinyl's so tactile. Um, Are are you guys familiar with this resurgence? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, I've, ah, I've, I've got a couple of, uh, I think I've got Banjo-Kazooie and Perfect Dark soundtracks behind me from my M8 bit. Oh, fantastic. Right, okay. I don't, I don't really have a record well. player to play them on, but... Um, you just bought them because they're so beautiful. They, they're lovely. They look yeah, good. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to... I'll, I'll get to this. Obviously, you guys already know, so you better back me up. But So they're bringing out this... I, from I Am 8 bit um, that you obviously use, and they're bringing out the Persona 5 vinyl soundtrack now the essential version and that's going to come with four records and which will have selected tracks because i think there's like a hundred odd tracks um within this game and by the way the music is fantastic Um, me and claire are like singing these songs all the time we're just like humming them uh battle theme (laughs) oh it's so good anyway um so they're selected tracks curated from the atlas sound team and that's going to be a hundred dollars there's also a deluxe edition that's going to feature the complete soundtrack over six vinyl records, what? and that's going to be one hundred and seventy-five dollars. With a, and that's a limited pressing of a thousand. Um, and also, they're going to make a documentary uh, as well for the deluxe edition, um, documenting the entire process of the creation of the albums with videos, photos, and interviews, including the mastering process, the test presses, vinyl production, the packaging, and, of course, the beautiful artwork. So I looked at this and I thought, I'll go and have a look at im 8 bit where they're selling it from, just you know, just have a, get a little bit more information. So off I went to im 8 bit and it sounds like you guys are already in the know. And I all of a sudden got hit with Last Guardian, Journey, Undertale, Hyper Light Drifter, Monument Valley. I was like, what? There's these soundtracks for all these games on record. And I was just looking at them. And if you haven't been, listeners, you need to go to IM8-Bit and just have a look at these records because 
They're not all $100 each, by the way. Like, the Journey one's $35, but they are real things of beauty, and if you've got an appreciation for the game in question and if they've got it, it's a really nice souvenir um, piece of merchandise for a game you love. It's I haven't got a record player either, but I can't help but feel the pull to, to buy these things of beauty. They're just lovely. Yeah, have they, you they, seen the... They, um, Oh, sorry, James. After you. No, go on, Anthony. I was going to say, have you seen the Rocket League one? That's absolutely just gorgeous. You know, yes. the, the cover to the Rocket League one is just amazing. No, I'm trying to find it now. <laughs> it, I was going to do a search. Basically, is it looks like the ball, effectively. It also a series of tires. It, it's grand. And the, honestly, I, I had to stop myself buying more of these. Uh, so once, I, oh. once, once I got the rare ones, it was. I need to either get a, a device to play them on, or I need to stop now. And <laughs> I chose the cheaper option of the two. <laughs> well, this is my question, okay. Do you get... I think with the Persona one, you get a digital copy too, because I thought we moved on from vinyl, because you get that kind of... You get that white noise, that crackle. I don't, I don't think it's bad. It depends on the hardware that you've got to play it, because I've got a friend who actually is involved in electronics and makes um, AV equipment... And there are some super duper crazy expensive LP mm. players that are supposedly as as crisp as you can get, like minimal crackle. And I think crackle is the exception nowadays. It's not like a you know, like a nineteen twenties HMV advert. Um, but yeah, I think I think most of them come with MP3 uh, downloads. It's just that there's something beautiful about the physical artifact because these. These discs aren't just there for the noise; they're there for the artwork. Because yeah. I think, like the Battletoads one, is is like a ripply green um, all throughout. Like the Rocket League has got the the wheels on it. Each of them seems to has their own thing. Like Thumper's yeah, but, got a, a twisted portal on it. It's they they go to town on the disc as well as the artwork. They're a real labour of love by the look of it. Yeah, it's really, just phenomenally beautiful. Like it's. Like I say, just seeing it, I'd, I'd heard that I'd heard sort of you know in the periphery that vinyl was people were getting more interested in vinyl again, and they were getting it because of the tactile quality. And I thought that doesn't make any sense. I thought it, the needle got dust, and it sounds like and all this. But then I went to this website, and it wasn't the Persona Five one because I thought, well, I'm not likely going to spend hundred to hundred and seventy five dollars on it. I mean, I like Persona Five, but. I like it a lot, but I don't think I like it that much yet. But then I like, looked at say the Journey one. And I was just kind of like, this disc personifies my love for the game. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's like you were talking about last week with like the, um, the Final Fantasy figures and what have you. This is just another avenue for you to show your appreciation. And the nice thing about these is that you can mount them very easily on the wall as well. So you can have that talking point, that, that focus that you can just have instead of a picture or a painting or something. Yeah, like put it in a frame and yeah. mount it. Yeah. Absolutely, oh, even, nice I think idea. it was, it might have been Ikea, but one of the, I remember seeing, because I was looking at this at one point for some, some Prince albums, you know, to put them in the, on, on the wall, um, and you can actually get it, so there's a frame, and I'll see if I can find a link, and I'll stick it in the show notes and definitely send it to you guys, uh, but it's a frame where you basically, similar to the I Am 8 bit, where you have the cover, and then the record just kind of comes out, you know, half of the record comes out, so you can see what that looks like as well, um, and, and you can then just lock that in to a frame, you know, and that was just really stunning. And when I saw that, I was like, "Oh, can I get Sign of the Times?" You know, and Nicola was like, "No," and I was like, but it was like it was really cool because at one point I was very much, um, I was very much, I wanted a carbon. There was a carbon turntable in my local Seven Oaks Sound and Vision. Um, there was a, a carbon, and it was about, I think it was about four hundred pounds for this carbon turntable, but it plugged in to my um, AV unit, so you mm. had, so you had the um you had the record player but then you could then just plug it into your av unit and have it kind of on all of your five speakers in the movie room and i was so tempted to buy this i went for i went to i think because one of my kef speakers was uh, the hinge got a bit loose and i went there and i almost came away with this turntable it was like so i took it for those guys just to fix it for me and then i almost kind of came away with quite an expensive turntable and there was some really it's it's definitely it's complete hipster you know now you know there's <laughs> this 
to you know you evolve into complete Is that derogatory or not? Yeah, no, it, no, it's not. I, I absolutely love it. I was very, very tempted. I have in my storage unit. I have a lot of vinyl. And when I was younger, I had a lot of vinyl. You know, I've got ranges from everything from you know Zeppelin to the Beatles to Prince to to De La Soul. You know, I had a lot of vinyl, and and I've still got it. And it's still and it's the way that I've packed it. It hasn't warped. So I would you know, I would just love to do that. And that crackle, I was actually oh, <laughs> it's so so that I am kind of evolving into complete hipster because there was a point where I wanted I was trying to look for an app that would actually add that to my MP3. You wanted that authenticity. <laughs> yeah. So when I started Brilliant. playing like uh, like the like side of the times that you before it started playing, you just got that kind of little crackle that as you crack. kinda of, yeah, and it was just that deck. Yeah. And I was I was longing for that because by all accounts there is something about the analog sound of a record. It's like the digital sound of a record, and I might be getting this completely wrong, but because um, AV Forums podcast that I listen to on a Monday, they always talk about this, and there's like the digital sound of like a symbol is being crashed. The digital sound of the symbol will cut off before the sound on the record player will. So it's things like that, and if you have a keen ear, you know, or you're listening to it with headphones, you can appreciate kind of those, and it's just. Yeah, it's something that I've I've always kind of been toying of jumping in and out of. So it's kind of like with the record. I don't know. I'm just sort of asking. This is a question. I don't know. Um, you get a fuller range of the sound, whereas an MP3, yes, because of condensing and what have you. Even if it's at a high bit rate, can't the, the record's almost like an original, like analog recording that a digital one can't replicate exactly. Absolutely. You wow. know, if you go onto Amazon now. Uh, not right now because we're podding but if you go into Amazon now you can find the latest records that are released a lot of them are coming out in vinyl as well so it's not just old records that you're finding it's either things have been remastered and and brought out again um, in vinyl or the latest album maybe like the latest Gorillaz album will also come out in vinyl that's a beautiful thing I love this sort of retrospect retrospective look back to the old technology that actually sounds like it's great technology I'm feeling I'm feeling as we have this conversation that a record player is becoming an essential purchase <laughs> from zero five minutes ago <laughs> and I'm starting uh, the story of the car especially when you mentioned a carbon one I was like oh, wow that sounds good um, but guys right I've sent you a link I don't know if you've had time to have a look at it yeah, but yeah. on I am 8 bit I've just seen this because it was sort of on the slider Zelda Hero of Time LP Legend of Zelda, Ocarina, music from the Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. Just this looks absolutely amazing. Mm. Oh man, it's just it's beautiful. And um, there's a little preview that I can't really listen to, but there's a ten minute preview of the music on the website as well. And, and, and for, for those worrying, it's not straight from the N64 cart. It's recorded <laughs> with a with a symphony orchestra. So, uh, yeah. sixty four piece orchestra. Wow. And the, the, the just the cover and the records. Because you get two LPs with it, they mm. just look, they just look amazing, just look amazing. So there you go. Just thought I'd mention it. A new to me, and I'm glad you guys already knew about it because you, you've taught me a little bit about it as well. It's uh, and probably cost it's Claire a fortune. Yeah, Claire, um, you've got thirty days. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, and so um, over to you, James. Yes, uh, we're going to enter the Nintendo Annex. Um, and just off inside the uh, in the clothes cupboard where we're hanging our coats as we wipe our feet before making our way into the in the hall itself um, is the announcement that Nintendo are releasing a new handheld console. Um, now they've said for a while that they were going to still support the 3DS, but I don't know how many of us actually believed that. Mm. Um, but yeah, it turns out on the 28th of July they are releasing another new 2DS XL edition which what? I always, I hate I hate their naming conventions it's a new new 2DS XL so if you remember the 2DS it was this yeah. wedge shaped item that um, you know kids couldn't try and crack the clamshell because it was just one solid piece of plastic well they're effectively rebranding the 3DS taking out the 3D capability um and yeah releasing it in some new colors so at the end of this month, there will be two new versions out, along with the likes of... I think they're, they're scheduling three games to come out at the same time to reinforce that this is not dead, that the 3DS still lives on. But they're releasing Pikmin, um, uh, a Miitopia, which is a Mi RPG, and another Dr. Kawashash- Kaw- Kawashima's... I do apologise. Dr. Kawashima's brain training. Um, so yeah, 
the, wow. the 3DS is not dead. Long live the 2DS. Hooray! <laughs> um, it's just bizarre, isn't it, that they keep com- that they will continue to support this? Do you think that's just yeah. kind of a, a backup, just in case the Switch doesn't doesn't do well, that they've I, still I, got a finger in a pie? I think it might be a finger in a pie, or maybe they're just they just wanted to try and support this for a little while. You know, in the same way that the PlayStation 2, the PlayStation 3, the Xbox 360 have all been supported for a certain amount of time mm-hmm, mm-hmm. before they cut them off. Because like the, the Wii U, there was not enough of um, an install base there to really worry about just going, nope, we're done, shut the doors. I, I don't think there was a massive clamouring user base that would have actually sustained it beyond Zelda. Zelda was the last hurrah. Whereas at least with the 3DS, there are many multiple dozens of millions of people out there with it. So it didn't seem as sensible just to pull down the shutters and walk away from this. This mm. is like a, hey, we're still going to carry on doing it, but the main draw will be the Switch. Yeah. 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 I, just, I like it. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah, it's, it's, there, so there's a black and turquoise and white and orange. I just um, don't understand where the market is, because little Johnny's not going to be not going to be happy with the 2DS when he can get us... I know it's, a lot, it's double the price for a, for a Switch, but I don't know. It's kind of like... Where's the market? Because any new purchasers, wouldn't they be getting a switch, or is, is the people that would be that would say, "I would rather have this"? I, I don't understand the selling point. That's that's the thing. I, I understand them still supporting the 3DS and what have you, and, and that family. But I mean, they must have identified a market. But it's just uh, it just confuses me a little bit who those people would be. And I guess because of the configuration of the 2DS or 2DS XL, you know, because of the configuration of that, those games can't port over to the um, to the Switch, can they? Because we've got Fire Emblem Echoes, we've got Hey Pikmin, which we were talking about, with there's an Ever Oasis game that's coming out, which is also another RPG. And then there's a whole batch of Kirby games as well that are coming out for Kirby's 25th anniversary. So, you know, or there's so Kirby's Blowout Blast, Kirby... A Clash Deluxe and also a multiplayer game as well. So there's there's kind of all of those kind of titles that are still coming out. So they're still kind of bringing uh, games out for those people that have a, a 3DS or a 2DS. Um, but surely shouldn't they just be kind of giving us even more of the good stuff over on the Switch? Well, you've uh, that's answered the question. If there's a load of stuff that's exclusive and there's fans that are dedicated enough, then at least that explains my question about mm. who they're selling it to. Yeah, well, these are all coming out kind of June, July, kind of around that time. This is when you're going to get all of those games. And I think it's also the time where people start going on holiday as well. Mm. Like it's, it's just starting to get to the, the the summer holidays where, you know, you're going to pack little Johnny on an airplane for a long period of time. Maybe, you know, there, there are kids without handheld devices and maybe you don't want to send an iPad on the on the plane for that time. I guess it just reinforces that that market with some nice nice colours, new games. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, it could be an impulse buy at the at the airport that you could just kind of pick it up for this <laughs> for little Johnny, who's a still yeah. spoiled brat that gets everything. <laughs> you get one free with the with, with the Chinese in Tunbridge Wells. So that's the kind of thing. Do, isn't <laughs> what a kid? <laughs> if you a child, what little Johnny? No idea. Oh, okay. What kind of what kind of get to keep the delivery boy? What on earth are you suggesting? I'm just suggesting about free console. Um, your free children, um, I don't want to know about. With every delivery, you get a free kid. Oh, this no. is, this is, these are just novelty elbow patches for Anthony. Just one on each arm. Yes. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Superb. Oh. And then kind of keeping it Nintendo, we're staying in this annex. Um, it's, I guess it's kind of strange, um, expected, and a little bit sad news, is that um, Nintendo uh, will not be showing. So Nintendo are a no-show for this year's E3. So we had a, a Nintendo financial report happened, I think, at the end of last week. And I'll put a link to the full, um, the full slide deck um, that, that is up but in a PDF. And it's very, it's very interesting. And talk about a lot of the, the stuff we were just talking about. But the last slide, the very last slide before the thank you, basically, just said that 
they confirmed that they will not um, they will not be showing at this year's E3 so they will not be showing at the games trade show E3 which is held in Los Angeles in June um, they will not be hosting a large scale press conference uh, for the investors analysts and media now this doesn't mean that we won't get um, maybe a presentation or maybe a treehouse but they basically said that they are going to let everybody else kind of do whatever they want for the switch or like Ubisoft or EA so those third parties will will potentially be showing some switch titles um but what nintendo will be doing at e3 is they'll be showing off splatoon 2 um and they'll also be showing off super mario odyssey so we're going to get pretty similar to last year where they had zelda breath of the wild in one of the halls at e3 we're going to get the very same thing here which is going to be showing mario odyssey and splatoon um but there will not be any conferences so we've got a microsoft ea ubisoft and um and Sony conference, but there will be no no Nintendo conference this year, which is a bit of a shame because I was hoping they would come back, you know, with a big orchestra like they did. I think it was good a good four years ago where they had a full orchestra, and it was just and that was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. When you first said when you first said orchestra, I, I was just flicking back my mind to uh, was it the Wii Music event? I thought that wasn't can't oh. really call that an orchestra. Oh. But, uh, no, because I remember when you were, they were coming on and they were playing. They were playing all of the themes. Um, why am I thinking of Sony? No, I am thinking of Nintendo. They did. They did a full, not that one, not when they were like, and you can use your Wiimote your, your, <laughs> <laughs> as a flute. <laughs> but, uh, that was. But I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I, I thought they would. Um, I thought there would be a showing this year at E3. I, I don't. I, I honestly didn't think they would be there for a press conference. Like they've they've made their stock and trade now out of those tree houses and those mm-hmm. streams, and I think to go back on that to actually appear in person to have that audience, I think we're just flying the face of the success because they do get to operate on their own rules and they do get the editing value that you get from running a stream rather than having a press conference. Because mm. like we, we you couldn't have done those puppets that they had a couple of years ago if you had someone on stage trying to talk and get the message across and then inviting indie devs on or stuff like that. I I, I actually prefer the way they do it as it's... I, I think if everyone did it, it wouldn't be impactful. But because you suddenly get this stream, because you suddenly get this like twist of creativity among everyone else's press conferences, I think it's a welcome welcome focus for people back at home. Hmm. Yeah, a bit refreshing. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point. Yeah. I was hoping... That they might change, but I think you know. I think you're hitting the nail right on the head there, James. And after making your case, I, I, I agree completely with you. Um, what I'm hoping is that because we've had two amazing games, mm-hmm. um, Zelda and, and Mario Kart on the Switch now, but they've both got their roots in, in pr- the previous console. Mm. You know, development of Zelda was was originally for Wii U. Obviously, Mario Kart Eight is a port with a lot of extra stuff. I'm really excited, and obviously there's Mario Odyssey to look forward to, but that's quite a way off. I'm really excited for them to show us something that's sort of been developed with the Switch only in mind. That's a little bit nearer than Mario Odyssey, and I'm hoping that maybe they'll uh, draw the curtain on, on something at E3 in their, in their treehouse, or in whichever way they, they decide to, to show us. Because do, um, do we have a release date for Mario Odyssey? He says quickly, trying to Google it. Holiday, holiday, twenty seventeen. That's all we've got. Okay, yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's going to be this off. side anyway. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, could it be F Zero? But I thought it won't be an F Zero game because surely that's too similar to Mario Kart. So what they franchise disowned F Zero? The, the fact you've got two F Zero tracks in Mario Kart is also a, a, an absolute joy and just damning towards the fate of that franchise. I loved uh, F Zero X, but I can't see it coming back. Another GameCube game. Hmm. Yes. Oh, I'll add that to the list. <laughs> yeah, that's did, a good one. did you know that Mario Kart actually started its life as a F Zero multiplayer game? Really? Yes. Wow. wow, that could have turned very different. Absolutely. So it was all just that was it. Not not with characters. It didn't even have Mario and all, anything like that. It was just it was all kind of part of F Zero's multiplayer. Cool. Wow. They just expanded into Mario. Yeah. Oh man. Indeed. I mean, so what what kind of franchises would you like to see them? Are you talking? I mean, we we've been talking kind of on Twitter over the weekend, like um, Animal Crossing. You know, I've I've always said since oh, yes. since that DLC for the Wii U, and I saw kind of all those, <laughs> as you put it, James, those rather large Animal Crossing characters. But I've always I just like <laughs> I would love an Animal Crossing game on my Switch. I just think that would be absolutely fantastic. But please don't be a retread. 
of the original Animal Crossing in such a blatant way as New Leaf was, and it seems to me every Animal Crossing, and maybe you can't do anything else with Animal Crossing, but they're all so similar. They, they are uh, they are similar, but that's like saying Mario Kart similar in the way you drive a car around. Hmm. He says you, he says you, putting his Animal Crossing defender hat on. Ah, uh, well, okay. <laughs> well, let's get the gloves on. But like, I mean, in, in Mario Kart, it's, you know, you're constantly sort of adjusting, and it's just game of skill. But you know, in Animal Crossing, if you if, like, Claire did the first one, and I sort of watched her. I, I she liked it that much that I passed the pad over to her, and she collected all the insects and all the animals. She she completed it basically on the GameCube. Oh, I love that music so much. I won't re- do a rendition now. Um, but then I got a new leaf on the DS, and she just basically said, "I just feels like I've done it all before." I, I and she she couldn't be bothered with it, and so and then they've done another one. Um, was it Back to the City or something like that? Yeah. And I didn't get her that because I said, "How about this one?" And she said, "Well, is it just the same?" And I read the reviews, and I said, "I don't know for sure, but it sounds like it probably is quite the same formula." And she said, "She was just like, well, I don't want to do it again." She she said, "I wish there was an Animal Crossing where they did something different." I'm not sure what they could do different, but you know, I I agree. It's, it kind of gets a bit stale retreading the old ground, except for the people that have never played it. Yeah, then it'd yeah. be wonderful. But I mean, even as a staunch defender, I I have to say, I think we we've basically played the handheld ones. We got we got drawn into the GameCube one when it first came out, and then we skipped the the Wii version because again, it was just like too close. But the 3DS version, we we mined like there was no two other. We've got a cricket score in terms of hours played on that. So I think it's the, <laughs> wow. as long as you give yourself enough gap between them, because I can I can completely understand if you play them back to back to back how. Because how engaging they are in terms of time you can sync to them compared to how different they are. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe I tried to... I was so excited about loving a game that maybe I tried to force the next one on too soon and I broke it. (laughs) I broke the spell. Um, But I think because... I I don't think it's a mainstream title. So I think a bit like Mario Kart for all the people that didn't get a Wii Wii U, you know. um, I think that there's such a big audience now because of the way the Switch has been selling that loads of people would just fall in love with the game and Mm. that I can understand as a reason for for releasing it again you know even if it was the same as as any of the others that have been released but what I what I want to get excited about going just going back to my point is is one of their franchises with that's been built from the ground up for switch and is kind of new kind of new for the switch so you do want you do want a retread of something like Pokemon or Smash Brothers you want something that's completely a brand new IP basically no no it could be one of their existing ones but but something that we know has been you know that you can tell has been made just for switch Mm. sort of thing you know it could be something I'm not that into the Pikmin series but that would you could tell if they, I'm sure they could make that you know for the switch, but I don't know if they've got the got the interest in in in, in Pikmin for, that they take the risk on it. Um, I'm just my, I'm trying to fly through the characters and stuff. Um, I think Smash Brothers could work really well, you know, when you do link it, linking up with the different systems, two players on each system and stuff like that. A bit like Mario Kart could be really awesome. Um, but yeah, just just something, just something a little bit new. Yeah, I, I I don't know if they'll. I can't see them doing something like Smash this year though, because they've already put out in one calendar year a Zelda, a Mario Kart, and a Mario, and then you're leaving your hmm. and Splatoon your, your as well. <laughs> yeah, you're you're yeah. basically yeah. putting all your pillar franchises right up front with nowhere to go. There um, must be room for a new IP though. Oh yeah, Maybe, I I, you know, I, in, I hope so. There. I hope so. It'd be great if there was. Yeah, cause I, and. I just worry they the might have shown everything they were going to put out this year at the Switch reveal. In the, in that sense that it's better to have all the big things, the heavy hitters, the things that will intrigue people mm. out when it's announced, out when they're actually trying to get people to pre-order and then worry about E3 later. So I almost think E3 might be a what's around the corner rather than what's out this year. Yeah, and that that's fine. I mean, yeah. Mario Kart's got infinite playability. So for me, Zelda and Mario Kart is okay. Yeah. Till um, Mario Odyssey, um, so that's good. I just hope, you know, I'm just crossing my fingers that there's something in that interim. Maybe Arms will be a hit. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, De- I'm not deathly excited. Silence for arms. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not excited <laughs> about Arms. I can't. I saw an advert today on TV, and I just thought I can't. I can't be doing with that. You know, kind of pretending to punch it, <laughs> uh, pretending to punch. It. I'm just like, no, I'm not. But but Splatoon has me interested. Now, I never played the original Splatoon, uh, but this one they've actually got a four-player co-op 
story mode um, in Splatoon. They they released a trailer last week, and that kind of that definitely has me interested because I think that will be like a ton of fun. Again, it's that co op. Um, it's definitely something we we need to we need to have a Nintendo network because otherwise we're going to be using Skype or Xbox Live, you know. But but that kind of could be interesting. You know, Splatoon story mode as well as Splatoon multiplayer. You know, the story mode could be quite could be quite fun. Yeah, definitely. I think it could be. And, you know, Splatoon, that's a great example of Nintendo taking a really popular genre and putting their own stamp on it, isn't it? With mm. the way that you cover everywhere with paint to be able to, well, that's how you win the game, isn't it? But then you, you travel through the paint really quickly. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's that's great. I mean, maybe I'm wanting too much. It's just because uh, the, the, these games that they have brought, that brought out are absolutely fantastic. I mean, I haven't played Mario Kart yet, but I know that Mario Kart 8 is fantastic and this has got more stuff. So it's going to be amazing. And you guys tell me it's amazing. <laughs> But it's just kind of it's just a little little yearning for something switch switch exclusive that that's you know we all say oh wow yeah brilliant but isn't isn't that to. arms you know isn't arms a switch exclusive <laughs> isn't splatoon yeah no. yeah but, but something that was going to touch our hearts I don't right. think arms is going right. to do that okay yeah. I mean either not, not not just not just an exclusive to just to say we've got an exclusive I'm talking about something that we say oh yeah that's that's good. But I mean, I'll be interested because obviously we've we've got Mario Kart, which is which was in April. Um, I think Splatoon is June, so Mario Kart's April May. We've got June where we've got Splatoon. July we've got Arms. So I'll be interested to see if they do feel that kind of August, September, October, September. Bit. Yeah, they've yeah, got like, they could just yeah one more game to just bridge that gap mm. between um, between Arms and Mario, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely. So you know, it'd be I interesting. Would, yeah, that's to say, the one. Right, this is the one that's coming out now, and you know, and this is the one. And, you know, they, we've got another one that's coming out this year. But bear in mind, they have been pretty open as to what's coming, and they have said, you know, it's Zelda, Kart, Splatoon, Arms, and then Mario. So they have been, and we've obviously got a load of Nindies coming out as well. Um, so they have been quite open. So to put another one in there, it's either going to be a we didn't realise this was selling so much, so let's bring that game forward um but whether they could do that because it's going to be in a de- in a dev cycle that it might it might not be ready yet so it, it's it's a really interesting one i'm going to i think all of the conferences this year are going to be you know and i use that word a lot but it's going to be interesting because microsoft are on that kind of precipice of 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 scorpio so they're like here's 4k here's all of the good stuff that's coming out with it sony you're kind of you're looking at them thinking are you going to do something with PlayStation VR or is this another PS Vita? And then obviously Nintendo, everyone's just there because everybody's loving Nintendo. We you know we've we we got another couple of stories about Nintendo in our news. You know, we're 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 besotted again by Nintendo. So we're all just gonna be sitting there going, you know, give us what you've got. And right now we don't even know if there's going to be a treehouse, but we're we're hoping that they're going to show something and they're going to join the noise because they are back in gaming. They're back, you know. Nintendo are back. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> With such a conclusive argument, how could you? Yeah, yes. Drop the mic. Okay. That's it. The show's over. <laughs> I don't even know where we are now. Who's going? Is <laughs> Yours. <laughs> Edit, yes. Edit point one. More Nintendo. More Nintendo. Wow. Um, yeah, so Switches are still flying off the shelves as well, you know. It's not that the sales don't seem to have dwindled in the time since release. And GameStop uh, have been saying that it's not days that they're selling out, it's hours. So if you want a Switch, you've got to be quick. Um, Eric Bright, who's GameStop's Senior Director of Merchandising, um, has said... This is a quote from himself. Um, it's exceeding our expectations. We knew it would be a high demand product, but our switch allocations are selling out not in days, but in hours. The demand is so high that consumers have to react quickly to be able to get their hands on them. Um, and that's this week, you know. So it's it's got no signs of stopping this uh, this switch phenomenon, which is. That's I think incredible. surprised a lot of people. That's so cool. It was really funny. I was listening to a kind of funny uh, podcast this week, and they were saying one of the guys on the podcast was saying he was having his hair cut, and there was cu- there was quite a few kind of dude bros in the shop, and they were all having their hair cut. And someone said, "Best Buy have got switches." And this one guy, <laughs> halfway through a haircut, said to the barber, 
can I go and get this switch and I'll be back? Have you got time later? This guy went, no, if you leave now, I'm going to have to, you just, you know, I haven't got time. You'll just have to have half a haircut for a day. <laughs> you know, this guy flew Decisions. out of the shop with half a haircut. <laughs> That's brilliant. Shouting Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> Leroy. <laughs> but it was just like flying off to Best Buy to get kind of a, a switch. My goodness me. Well, yeah, it's uh, it's switch fever pitch switch, you know, at the moment. <laughs> People have got to react quick. Um, and also, it's not just the switch that was flying off the shelves, but the games too, as we know, you know, Zelda sold more of itself than switches um but also we've got some stats for mario kart now um so mario kart 8 deluxe obviously is out it's nintendo's first number one since pokemon white on the ds which was way back in 2011 wow um and it's the first time any game in the mario kart series has been at number one since mario kart wii and that was back in 2008 so, yeah, it's done really well. It's hit both the top of the Switch charts and the all-format charts. Um, and Nintendo of America have said that 459,000 copies were sold on launch day in the US. Wow. That's both retail and digital. Wow. So this means that Mario Kart 8 Deluxe it's, makes it the fastest-selling game in the series. The record um, was previous, previously held by Mario Kart Wii um, at 433,900. Um, and it means an attach rate to the game of 45%, which is, you know, we've talked about these attach rates before, like Horizon Zero Dawn being, you know, a great seller and 10% of owners having it. Mm. 45% is, uh, that's, is that's really good. That's an impressive good. attach rate, yeah. Yeah, it's. I, I think, I mean, Zelda must be a bit higher, but it's just uh, it's just really positive news. Um it, Apparently that it's been, and this is this is a good story as well from Nintendo, it's been selling so well, that Nintendo in US have resorted to uh, shipping it by air. Um, it's more expensive for them to do that, mm-hmm. but they Nintendo apparently have judged that the extra cost, which gives them a $45 loss per console, is worth it to help disgruntled customers. Wow. That's, so that's nice. That's really cool. You know, yeah. uh, the great thing about it was, I think I, I, I kind of a correction from last week. I said that Mario Kart was 11 gig. It's actually 6.5 gig. Um, so Mario Kart 6. So you can't, I mean, like the digital download will fit easily on that onboard storage. And for me, this is, so I, I downloaded it digitally for both myself and Nicola because I think it's kind of one of those games where you never want to be kind of with your Switch on a plane and go, oh, I forgot Mario Kart. You know, you mm. need to have, like, it, it needs to be on board. It needs to be on the on the memory of your of your switch because this is just it's absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. Can you share one copy or no? No, I had to buy two. I had to buy two. Ouch! Cool though. I just wondered if it had some kind of family sharing on there. No, it's not like it's not like kind of Xbox. So Nicola has our own account. I have my own account. You know, I think I don't know if in multiplayer you can share across multiples, but you know, if I'm off and I'm not getting back from uh, from from being you know in, in Manchester or London or whatever, and I don't get home until nine ten o'clock, and Nicola wants to play Mario Kart, I don't want to you know, stop her from playing it. So we just kind of had it on both of our switches, so we could just sit there and play it. So it was uh, so yeah, no, it's it's oh god. It's, it's so good. It's such a good game. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got it, Daz? Have you got it, Daz? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Superb. Right, the next piece of news staying in this gorgeous Nintendo Alex is... Um, Zelda. So we know that um, Zelda is going to have a couple of expansions and Nintendo this week um, on Zelda.com have actually listed or they've detailed the first piece of DLC um, for um, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So strap yourself in guys because this is quite interesting. So the first DLC is going to be coming out this summer and you're going to get now the pack is I did write it down here. It's $19.99 and $17.99 UK um, this is there's going to be two pieces of expansion one coming um, in winter 2017 but the first one coming in summer 2017 so what you're going to get in this first pack is you're going to get the trial of the sword now what this is in a certain location in in Hyrule you will take on the trial of the sword challenge so you basically face an onslaught of enemies kind of wave after wave so it's almost like a, a single player horde mode if you will um 
You start the challenge without any weapons or equipment, so similar to that island that you sent me to, Daz. Um, mm. And then you have to basically, enemies will be, it's room, so you have to defeat the room and then you move on and then you upgrade Link. The, um, Nintendo say that there's going to be about 45 rooms in total, and by doing this, by finishing the trial of the sword you'll get the power of the master sword so the power of the master sword will be unlocked and this will be an ever glowing ever powered up state master sword for your for, for unlocking the trial of the sword that's I, I think that that talent alone is worth probably going through those 45 rooms yes Absolutely. Um, the next thing that you're going to get, and there's quite a few here, but the next thing you're going to get is Hero Path Mode. Now, Hero Path Mode, I could have done with this right from the start. I don't know about you guys, but this is this is a new map feature that shows the path Link has walked through Hyrule. The only caveat, the only kind of asterisk to that, is that it will say from the last 200 hours of gameplay... Wow, I wonder if it remembers what you've done in before you applied the patch. That's what I was but, thinking, yeah, because otherwise I'm not walking around again just to tick those off. <laughs> I suppose it'll have to, won't it, really? Well, what it says is use the time tracker bar to see where you've spent the most time and where you have uh, yet to explore. So I think the answer to that is yes, it's going to show you. If you've played... I'm like 130 hours um, so you know I'm okay at the moment but if I'd gone over that 200 you can actually rewind um, and you can use your time tracker to actually kind of see where you've been Wow that's pretty cool if you want to seek out every single thing like we're talking about the speedrunners how they cover the entire map yes that'd be a great tool wouldn't it absolutely you know at the moment Nicola's kind of she is absolutely obsessed with uh Kuroko or Korok seeds she uh, she used that map that we were talking about on our uh, on our pod last week um, and she's basically just she fires up the map on her on her iPad peppers her map with little um little markers little leaf markers and then she's just going around and trying to find them there and then she removes the marker because it obviously leaves you a little kind of uh Korok seed so she's just and that's what she's doing she's just and she's similar to you um Darren, where she doesn't want to go to the last divine beast so she's got like one more divine beast to do and she doesn't want to do it because she's just enjoying the game so much so this is what she's doing at the moment she has this like, meta game going on yeah, she just doesn't want to go that way, even though it doesn't really matter. But no. she just doesn't want to feel that she's the step. Because after that, I suppose the next step is the end. But if you just keep that divine beast in between, yes. you're not quite there yet. <laughs> exactly. You know. And then, so the continuing on from the expansion, we've got hard mode. So what this is 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 two things. Is a all of the enemies have basically are powered up. So your red uh, boko blins, um, which are normal, they are now blue, and and so on. So it just kind of like, bubbles up. So they get hard. Harder, but they also will regain health as well. So while you're oh. fighting them, if they fall back or you fall back to maybe just uh, wait for a recharge or a stasis or whatever you're doing, they're actually going to regain health. So it really is kind of giving you that new game plus almost feeling to uh, to Zelda. <laughs> the true Zelda Souls starts here. <laughs> Indeed. So there's, there's some good stuff too to that as well. If you look up, you may also find enemies and treasure chests in the sky as well. And um, and that's what they're kind of saying. With that, there's quite a good picture of some uh, Blocko Blins um, basically just hovering with balloons on platforms. <laughs> so, so. Just tied to an Octorock sack, is it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's just like, so that's really cool. So you've got that. You've also got a travel medallion. So somewhere in the world, there's a tress with a travel medallion inside. And this will actually allow you to fast travel to points on the map. So you no longer have to go to a shrine. You can actually fast travel to a point on the map once you've found the travel medallion. So I thought thought that was quite cool. And then wrapping this up, there's new armour. There's a Tingles outfit. So you could run around dressed as Tingle, (laughs) and this is beautiful. I'll stick a link to this in the show notes for the Tingle outfit. I wanted to buy the DLC just for this Tingle outfit. Um, But the (laughs) The inspiration for a thousand cosplayers, (laughs) exactly. Um, So they have they have one which has the. 
the Twilight Princess um, kind of uh, headpiece that that you had, and also there is a Majoro's mask as well. I think it's Medina's helmet from Twilight Princess. But the the last piece of this kind of DLC pack one is a Karok mask. So you'll be running around Hyrule with a Karok mask on your face, and you just look like one of those. Um, and what it will do is it will shake. So whenever you're near a hidden location and there's 900 of those in the game, but whenever you're near the location, it will start to just wobble, it will start to vibrate, it will start to shake um, to tell you that there's one to be discovered. Ah. It, it, it just... There's, there's part of me thinks that that is a great thing and also an awful thing at the same time because I've long made peace with not wanting to get 900 <laughs> hidden items in a map that large. And so even just giving me the tiniest hint that you could have some help doing it <laughs> is just evil. And of course, you can now with that uh, with that location mapper, you can see where you've been as well. Yeah. So, so you'll be able to you'll be able. And I always thought I thought that would be really good if it actually kind of filled the map, so you can. Because Nicola went somewhere the other day, and I was like, I've never been there. Where are you? I need to go there right now. And it's just really bizarre that there's there's air, after 130 hours, there's places I haven't been in Zelda. But that, that's the joyful thing about the map, and I'm I'm honestly on the fence about getting the first expansion pack before the um uh, before the because in the second expansion pack they're talking about a whole new dungeon mm-hmm. and i just don't know if there's enough here to really make me want to play it just for these things i, I don't know whether i just want to save up and play it all when the new dungeon comes up but there's some very nice mm. little additions like the the map yeah especially like cuz mm. i i do want to get 120 shrines legit mm. And just seeing where you haven't path through, because I, I, I'm no doubt that despite going through three quarters of the map already, there will be just like this gaping hole in my path in one yeah. of the regions that I haven't gone through. So that'd be nice for a sanity check, anyway. Yeah. Do we have uh, a price? Yes, like I said, it's um, nineteen ninety nine dollars and seventeen ninety nine um, UK. Okay, so that's for two, isn't it? That's for DLC pack one and two. Yes, yes. Uh, The the seventeen ninety nine. It's it's available on the Nintendo Store, or it's also available on Amazon. You can buy a a card, you know, with an unlock code. And and you're right, that does give you both pieces of DLC. So really, it's kind of, yeah. It's just uh, it's 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 eight pounds. Yeah, uh, per, per, per 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 batch. I think I think even if you count it, the dungeon will be worth more. So maybe maybe can I square this way? Going yeah, this is this is a fiver's worth of content. Maybe yeah, and I go and get yeah, twelve quid's worth later on. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, the Tingles whatever. outfit alone is worth like six pounds. <laughs> oh, you're a bad man. <laughs> there will be people though. <laughs> tingle I mean, tights. Were so clever. Oh, There'll tight. be people that will just like go yeah, Tingle outfit. That's it. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as I try and scrub that mental image from my head. <laughs> And you can also buy them on Amazon. You, I bet you can. I bet you can buy a real life Tingle outfit. And the next piece of news. <laughs> so I think that's it from the Nintendo Annex. Uh, next piece of news is with you, JT. <laughs> God. Um, yes. Uh, so the next piece of news is uh, some sales updates from Capcom, oh. and it's mainly about Resident Evil Seven and Dead Rising, and the fact that Capcom think they have underperformed slightly. So Resident Evil Seven actually managed to shift a very respectable three and a half million um, across the world, which I didn't. I, I thought that was quite good. Mm-hmm. I mean, I thought the Resident Evil series has been. It's been on the decline recently. I don't think five and six really held up the good name of the series, but three and a half million's okay. Mm. Um, but it's uh, half a million short of the four million that Capcom were expecting. Um, so I'm not quite sure what repercussions that might have. Um, but um, also, it's not the only one that underperformed because Dead Rising Four sold about a million copies, um, which is far less than the two million they were hoping to make. Um, uh, of course, that was that was just Xbox One exclusive as right, well. So, right. um, so that's why it's far less than the the four million anyway. Um, mm. But yeah, it's a disappointing, I think, for for Capcom then if they set them at those values. But um, you know, three and a half million, one million isn't too much to be sniffed at. But I guess it's how much uh, cash they put into making it in the first place. Hmm. Is it Dead Rising coming out on the PS4? I would, I would completely expect so because I'm sure there was wasn't there like a one and two pack that came out yes. roughly the same time. <laughs> well, if it wasn't before, after a million sales, it's definitely going to do that now. Isn't yes, it? <laughs> it's coming out on everything now. <laughs> yeah. Crank out the handles. 
But like um, I say, it's a bit disappointing because in Resident Evil 7, even though I never finished it because it's just too scary, but even though I never finished it in VR, um, it's such a great game, you know, and it was such a great return to that Resident Evil 7. So when it's sold 3.5 million, okay, you know, that that's still not a number to be sniffed at. It's such a shame that um, Capcom and other um, developers and publishers kind of do stick these high figures because I remember reading something similar about Lara Croft, about Tomb Raider. Yeah, yeah. Where they were, it's all like five or six million, but they estimated eight. And they, as you say, James, it might be because that's how much money they put in, and they need that to kind of get back into the red. But it's just such a shame because that's such a great game. Resident Evil Seven is just such a great game. Yeah, it's a pity. And I suppose when you, you know, when you look at it that way, and that's that's the way that it will be looked at. You know, it's a business at the end of the day. How can you rectify that? Well, spend less money on the creation of the next game less production values which will mean more profit if it sells but the trouble is if the production values are less and people sort of don't like it then it could have even more of a detrimental effect and it's like a downward spiral mm. but, but i guess it's where it draws the line because like, you guys spoke about like the double a thing from last year uh, for, for last week and there's part of me that almost agrees with it because dead rising 4 yeah that that seems like it should be a big open world or so and maybe resident evil actually to to buy in with its b-movie so it, it just feels like i could get away with like a b-movie makeover at that point mm. in time you can still get terrifying but you can get it terrifying on a very small basis at this point in time make it make it a more condensed experience and maybe you don't have to throw as many people at it but but then again maybe maybe four million is what they were hoping in total and actually they broke even at two million so there's still profit there just not as much profit as they hoped hmm I suppose we'll see, won't we? With we'll see where the series goes. It's like like everything, you know. Time will tell. And when we start to hear rumours of uh, where the Resident Evil franchise is going, it'll answer. It'll answer that question. Yeah, yeah. If anything, it's just maybe they they just readjust, going well. This is what it shifted next time round. This is the budget. This is what we're expecting. Plan and it's funny when you get when the PMO talking. in. Get them. Get them with their wipeable post its. There you go. If they have wipeable post its. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Scrub off four mil. That would have saved on two. Away we go. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. I mean, like this game was heavily marketed as well. Um, you know, so maybe spent a little less on the market. I mean, this was everywhere. Whenever you were in London, you know, this was absolutely everywhere. You know, Resident Evil Seven. There was posters, and there was there was. Um, animated kind of posters as you were going up escalators i mean it was just everywhere and it was sponsoring tv shows on tv you know it was just and and as you say they didn't have any wipeable post-its so what do they expect <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's about it just uh, just a quick catch up on uh, capcom's es- hmm. expectations so the next piece of news daz is with you yeah this is just a quick um, random trio of news um, so what have we got? Wipeout has gone gold. Excellent. Which is awesome news. Um, so that was tweeted out the other day. I didn't uh, even know there was a Wipeout coming out. So this is... <laughs> oh, wow. This Wipeout is... Omega collection uh, coming out on PS4. Oh, okay, that one. Okay, yes. Are we all, yeah, are we all uh, guessing it? Are we all guessing it? Are we guys getting it? No. Uh, you were interested. I love Wipeout, but it's like, how many times am I going to buy Wipeout yeah. when it hasn't really changed? It's a bit like my Nintendo argument, really. This is... Cause this has got like a mixture of the PS3 tracks and the Vita tracks, but they're in 4K HDR, and I haven't played Wipeout for years. <laughs> 4K yeah. HDR, they've got Firestarter, crank up that surround sound. I've already, pre- I've already pre-ordered this digitally. I've already, but it's, it's also <laughs> only out on June the 7th. I mean, Dazzle, I've only just got Mario Kart. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you'll be like, Hot Wheels one week, Wipeout the next. <laughs> so you'll, you'll play I'll, this in I'll September. I'll stick with your Mario Kart, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice one. I, I, the thing is, Wipeout is very close to my heart. You know, Wipeout was what sold the PlayStation 1 to me. Um, so I do love it, and I'd love to play it in 4K. Um, but, I mean, Claire put it quite succinctly to me. She just said, she just sort of turned around, and I said, oh, Wipeout, hooray! And she was like, it's the same thing, though, isn't it? And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> I said, but it's really good. And she was like, but... <laughs> I was kind of like, yeah, all right. <laughs> she, she, well, she well stole... <laughs> she well, like, pulled the rug out from under me. But I, um, I love Wipeout, and... To play it in 4K with HDR, I probably won't pre-order. I mean, I don't usually pre-order, but I imagine that I'm going to have a very hard time ignoring it on release day. It's only about 19.99, I think. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's a cheap title. It's not a full price title. This is um, it's a double A. 
it is a double A title because I, I kind of bought it because I think I was saying last week I got an extra ten pounds. I got ten pounds credited to my PlayStation wallet. So I was looking through and I was like, oh, I'll get Wipeout, and I think I ended up paying like nine pounds or something like that for it. So I was like, bargain, and I just pre-ordered it. So just in case my ten pound went away um, from Sony, there was an expir- expiration. I just well, pre-ordered Wipeout. So I'm, I'm, I can't wait to play this. I was just thinking, you know, on the big TV, sound blasting. This is going to be amazing. Because it's got Firestarter, so you just play that constantly. Uh, <laughs> it's, got, it's definitely got Firestarter. It's definitely it? got Firestarter. Oh, well, I'm, I'm going to get it. I'm, I'm going to get it. Because it will remind me of the old days, 2097. See, 2097 is my favourite. Right. And I, f- I feel it dipped after that. I mean, first of all, we were waiting for a, a whole platform to go by before they got... I remember on PlayStation 2, I don't think we got a wipeout, did we? Um, I don't think we did, and we we could have sort of got wipeout. Then we got wipeout twenty ninety seven, and then there's this expectation that there'd be a wipeout because it was kind of a mm. an expectation that it came with the launch of a console, but it didn't come with the PS two. And we, but there was rumours about it, and then it came on the PS three, but not at launch again. And it took ages. I think there was lots of problems with uh, Signosis and things. We, yeah, it we was got Cygnosis, one on, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. We got one on the PSP. Yeah, which I got because I got a PSP for a birthday one year. Yeah. Um, I think when I was 30 when I got that, and I got a PSP and Wipeout mm. on it, and Resident Evil 4 on GameCube. Demon, what a demon birthday that was. Um, and, yeah, if it was, basically what I'm trying to say is, if it was a remake of 2097, <laughs> it wouldn't be able to stop me. But I felt that the PS3 one, until they did that update, didn't they? They did an update called uh, oh, Rage or something like that. Um Anyway, that's in here as well, so yeah, I'll probably get it. Mm. Cut a long story short, I'll probably get it, especially if it's got Firestar in it. Because it reminded me of the good old days on my PS1. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. I remember playing that. Uh, I was like, there was a group of group of friends, and we would just we would go to the pub, and then after that, we would then um, we would then just go back to kind of my house, and we would just play Wipeout, and that was it. You know, I think I don't know. There wasn't multiplayer, so we would do um, time trials. Oh wow, yeah, and do the ghost. Yeah, yeah, and it was just, it was so much fun. I think one of my friends, Zoe, she was just, I always remember kind of whenever I think of Wipeout, I think of Zoe, and I just like, she was just, she was the one, she was, she was the James. She was the, <laughs> as James is to Mario Kart, this, this, this girl was to Wipeout, you know, it, uh, you know, just infuriating and you wanted to beat them. Um, so <laughs> so. Oh wow. Well, I, I made a really good friend at work because we were, we were chatting at work. I mean, we're talking years, years ago now when Wipeout was out. Either the first or the second one. I think it might have been the one with Talon's Reach. Anyway, we were chatting about it and, I was just like, yeah, you know, Wipeout's amazing, and he was like, yeah, I love Wipeout, and we got into a chat about who was best, and he was like, yeah, I'm I'm best at Wipeout. I was like, no, I'm best at Wipeout. So we arranged, we 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 sort of like went on about it for a bit. We arranged this big tournament at my mate's house, and he turned up, and he had, I don't know if you remember it, I'd never seen one before, but he came with his little bag, and he opened it up, and out of the bag he reached in, and he pulled out a twisty pad for the oh, PlayStation. Oh yes. And he played Wipeout with his twisty pad, and what it was, just to explain it a little bit, was the pad sort of had a hinge in the middle, and it was cut in half, so you could twist it left and right, like an analogue twist, and that was the way he played it, and that replaced the left stick movement, so he could get a really good feel for it. I mean, I couldn't do it when he let me add a go, but he was amazing with it. I, I, and, I can uh, remember trying it. It always felt like you were like trying to pat your head and rub your tummy at the same time, though, because it's a completely <laughs> different axis. Yeah, it's a completely different axis, axis. But he he had he could just do it, you know, by doing that twist. That it's like a vertical twist. Is that a good description from the middle? Um, and yeah, I've never seen a twisty pad before or since. But um, we and we we became great friends. Um, so yeah, wipeout's gone gold. Looks like I'll probably be getting it. I'm glad you're getting it, Anthony, because we can play. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and James, maybe. No, I, I, I one racing. Look, if I'm gonna get, I, I'm not even a massive racing game fan. So buying Mario Kart and the new Forza updates in one month is probably, <laughs> probably me doing it for the next year. Well, this podcast costs me a fortune. <laughs> why, why do you only think I come on once a month? <laughs> Actually, that's good advice, man. We might have to switch or we'll save some cash. <laughs> Hold up a second. <laughs> So what's well, what's the next piece of news, Dad? How did you yeah, how did you manage to put three pieces of news in just one news item? I, well, I, the, right, the thing is, the Wipeout Gone Gold was the main news item. Right. And then just before coming on, on to pod, I saw these extra two, and I thought, I've got to get these on, so I thought I'd do a quick random trio. Pretty good, eh? Pretty, pretty sneaky. Anyway, so quickly, um, this next bit is, 
really cool. There's a live action Zelda game that you can play. It's going to be in London. Apparently, it's been in North America touring, and it's like one of these Escape the Room uh, games. So it's a live action game that you go along, Escape the Room game, but it's Zelda themed. Mm. It's called The Defenders of the Triforce. Um, and it's going to run it in the UK um, between the 14th and the 16th of July. Um, and what you do in it is you uh, go into a room and you have to solve six puzzles with other teams doing the same thing at the same time, um, from what I'm reading. Um, and you interact with Zelda characters, actors dressed up like Zelda characters. Um, it's Apparently it's really hugely popular uh, wherever it's been. There's going to be 15 sessions in London at the Islington Assembly Hall, which is five a day, over three days. It's a 90-minute experience, and as exciting as this is and as popular as it is, it's not cheap. It's uh, £30.98 to do it for 90 minutes, so it's pretty pricey, but apparently um, apparently it's pretty good. Yeah, so um, I'll, uh, one of the reasons I might have delayed you guys recording to begin with, uh, was me possibly trying to book tickets for this. <laughs> oh. Because <laughs> Ali and I have done a couple of like locked room um, star ones, and this is actually her birthday weekend, so um, I was like, do you mind if we, could we possibly, because she, she's not the massive Zelda fan, but she, she knows enough about it, so we've been getting in touch with a couple of friends who are down in London, and uh, yes, we are down, we are, we are on for that, of that weekend, so hopefully I'll be You're able to go? report back for the oh, Sparks. Excellent. Excellent. So, I mean, I'm not familiar with the prices. I've never done one of these Escape the Rooms. Um, is is that a competitive price, or has it got a bit of a premium because it's Zelda? Or oh, is that the, just a normal so, thing? So, so this is this is a this is a premium, but it's it's a bit unlike other locked room mysteries because we've done locked room mysteries before, where there's like between two and six of you, and you're basically locked in literally just a room for like an hour to try and escape. Whereas this is 160 people in in just an area that they are styling like Zelda. I'm imagining it's going to be like their E3 area from last year. I've tried to avoid pictures of it so I can keep it a surprise. But mm. with 160 of you around and there's characters to talk to and there's, there's you go back to your table to solve puzzles. So I think this is a different twist. This is going to be much an experience as it is a, More of a role quote unquote locked room thing. mystery. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I I can imagine like I would happily pay you know effectively it's, it's twice the price of what we usually pay for these type of things but it it seems like it's going to be worth it. Oh, excellent! Well, that's uh, it's great to hear you going on it because yeah, you can you can let us know what it was like. Yeah, yeah. For for next time it comes round into town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, in another few years yeah. or so. But people could maybe, if they're going to America, they could maybe tie it up. Um, and the next piece of news I've got, this is this is one that I couldn't resist putting in, Anthony, for you, um, is that there's going to be a ukulele patch that's going to tone down the uh, the annoying voices. Oh, really? So I thought you'd be happy about that. Apparently... Um, so it's not just me? No, it's <laughs> by no means just you. It wasn't just you at all. Um, so, yeah, the developers are going to put out a patch. It's going to quieten these guys down which i'm sure you'll be very relieved mm-hmm. at it's going to also allow you to skip the dialogue faster that was another bugbear apparently mm-hmm. and it's going to allow you to skip cut scenes and improve the, they're going to improve the game's camera which is also a bit of an, a oh, bit of a nuisance awesome right that's it do, do we know when this patch is coming out uh let me just have a look um do-do-do-do-do. I'm still waiting for my Switch version, which was my backer code. Um, I'm still waiting for that. That they haven't, we haven't got any dates on that. Um, but whenever this patch is coming out, I'm waiting to play into after this because that's all the things that I'm not liking about this game right now, which are the the camera and the and that god awful speech. Yeah, we haven't got a date. Right. It's uh, gonna in the in the coming weeks. Okay. Okay, I'll keep it because I'm still getting um, I'm still getting Kickstart backer updates. You get kind of backer updates, uh, even though it's kind of they are going to be bringing out some DLC just for people who kickstarted it as well. Um, so there's going to be some oh, peer, wow. um, some DLC that's exclusive. Um, so there's so like I say, we're still getting so maybe um, I think I skipped the last um, update, so maybe I should have read that. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that's I just thought that was a nice touch, and because you'd mentioned how annoying that mm. that, that sort of um, what was once quite endearing. Um, voice of the character was but I, don't, I haven't heard it in the game so I don't know just how annoying it is I just couldn't resist adding it in no. and, and sort of lightening up your day with it excellent stuff that's fantastic thank you very much cool and so over to you James 
Yeah, my uh, my final piece of news uh, for the roundup is news on Remedy's new project. So Remedy, the people who brought us Alan Wake and Quantum Break, um, are coming back with their seventh game. I assume it's their seventh game because it's codenamed Project 7. Mm-hmm. Um, and they found a publisher for it. So they're breaking away from Microsoft and going with 505 games. Uh, it's going to be for the PC, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. And there's no release date yet, but they have announced that it's going to be an intriguing story, a uh, third-person adventure with some deep gameplay mechanics. So all quite vague, all quite vague, but they are basically <laughs> hinting that it is going to be the same sort of style, I guess, that Quantum Break and Alan Wake made their names with in recent times, which I'm all for, because I've, I really liked the Alan Wake uh, style of approach. Uh, Quantum Break actually slipped me by. I think I was playing something else at the time. Um, but I, I do love the fact they try to invest as much in story and atmosphere as they do in the action and puzzles. So I'm actually really looking forward to this one. Absolutely. I mean, like I say, I'm the same as you, um, James. I, you know, I absolutely loved Alan Wake. I thought they were they were great games. You know, they really they really were the the mechanic, the whole <laughs> the whole battery, the light. You know, back to kind of Luigi's Mansion almost. Um, yeah. I, you know, and I and I I started I bought and um, started playing Quantum Break, but I I put that down and I've never gone back to it. So which is which is uh, which is a shame because it was a it was a an okay game but i just just never i kind of got past the first tv show um i got a little bit kind of past that and that was it you know i just was like no this just really isn't grabbing me yeah i want to try and see what they do this time around because obviously Mm. they try to create alan wake is almost like a book wasn't Mm. it It was all about writing and then quantum break had a very much a tv focus so i wonder if they're going to learn or make a twist on this or so but um yeah it seems like we've got a, a while to wait yet yeah, they're very ambitious, though. Yes, which, yeah. you know you can't you can't knock that. No. And uh, you know, in Alan Wake, uh, they learned some lessons, and then they you could see that, that those lessons were learned. But then that was also they had that, that massive ambitious like task of, of, of having sort of TV show and game at the same time, which they didn't do a bad effort of, did they? Really, no. you know, all, all said and done. So it'd be interesting to see now, you know, if without the constraints of having to. To do something well, let's let's imagine that they don't have the constraints of doing something that's never been done before in in that regard. Mm. Um, with the lessons that they've, they've learned and the, and the pretty stunning games they've they've come out with before, it could be something to get quite excited about. But as you say, it's a, it'll be a while before we know more. Mm. Absolutely, and, and you know, and five hundred five games. They're, they're they're quite a good publisher. They pulled out stuff like Payday and Abzu and Terraria Brothers. You know those kind of games. So they they've got uh, they've got a good a good kind of pedigree behind them to help them get that game out as well. Yeah, they're quite diverse, aren't they, in backing sort of big games and small games as well. Yeah, I think Sniper Elite Three wasn't it? I think that was one of their big games that they brought out. Yeah, and small. I mean, in budget because Terraria might be maybe a cheaper game to make, but it's absolutely massive. So I don't mean that in uh, in the context of, of the game world. Yes, and the game that I'm waiting to come out on the Switch, which is uh, Stardew Valley. Oh yeah, I can't wait for that to come Amazing out on the Switch. Game. That is just going to be because Stardew Valley on the Switch. You just get it out on the train, do that whatever days farming you need to do, and then you just continue playing Zelda or Mario. You know, then yeah, just go back to it. That yeah. sounds like the That's Animal Crossing I'm, approach, yeah. yeah. Yes, it's like they, they won't need to bring Animal Crossing out if Stardew Valley comes out. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 the I lines are drawn. <laughs> I remember telling. Oh no, I'm sorry, James. I forgot. <laughs> I remember telling. I remember telling Nicola about Stardew Valley, and I kind of went, oh, "This is it. This is the game." She went, "Oh yeah, I'm interested." And then I showed her the trailer, and she was just like, "Why does it have to look like that?" <laughs> and she was just, "I was like, this is part of it. This is part of the charm. Look, it's lovely." But she just wasn't having any of it. So hopefully, you know, with Animal Crossing, and it will look lovely and gorgeous. That would mm. be great. See, that's got that's got the graphics, hasn't it? Really. It's got that bit of extra uh, polish. Yes, indeed. Right, the last piece of news is with me, and it's a very quick one. Um, it's just that um, Darksiders 3 um, has been announced. We never thought this was coming, uh, but Darksiders 3 has been announced. It's part of the IGN first this month. So IGN kind of have a, a first where they unveil a game, un- unveil a game, and then they just basically follow it um, throughout the month, kind of giving you more and more information. So they, they 
announced it, um, I think it was yesterday they announced it, that THQ, Nordic, um, and Gunfire Games had announced that uh, Darksiders 3 will be coming. It's coming for PS4, Xbox One, and PC, um, but it's not coming until 2018. So this is going to be, uh, obviously it's the third one in the Darksiders series, and this is going to be an open world action game focusing on exploration and environmental puzzles. Kind of sounds like Zelda. I think, well, I think the original Darksiders was a bit like Zelda, but this is, uh, so this is, um, and this is going to be open, and you play as the protagonist is Fury. Um, so again, kind of one of those kind of uh, gods of war. You play as Fury, um, and, and then you take on kind of these environmental and exploration puzzles. So that's kind of all we have. There was a trailer. I'll stick a link to the IGM first in the show notes. Um, we, there was a CGI trailer that was basically just showing, showing you the game. Um, but we've got, a, we've got a year to wait um, before we get this. But it's quite interesting that, that we are actually getting a Darksiders 3. Yeah, I never actually played the the first couple, but everyone did say that like if you're looking for a Zelda action fix, then mm. this is the place to go. Absolutely, I played Darksiders one on um, Xbox 360, and it was it just felt like Zelda. It just felt like a Zelda game. Um, I never got around to playing the second one, uh, but the first one was 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 pretty was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. I remember playing the first one, and it, it was it was when I think there hadn't been a Zelda for a while or something like that, and there certainly was nothing like that. Um, mm on the consoles at the time so it was really refreshing and it ca- sort of came out of the blue as well didn't it mm. it was kind of like what's this we don't really recognize it but what do you know it's it's it's, it's a good game um yeah so it was good and i think it built quite a following didn't it which obviously it must have done to legitimize this this third iteration yeah absolutely i mean it was it was one of those games that was it was sold off as part of the thq when thq was liquidized uh, it was one of those ones that was sold off and then this other company um, which picked it up and then decided to keep the thq name and change it to thq nordic you know they they bought that property um but the whole kind of aesthetic of it the whole look was it was drawn and um, the kind of the concepts were drawn by a Marvel artist whose name is Joe Maduria, um, who just draws some amazing X Men comics for for kind of Marvel. And he was the one who kind of came up with the whole kind of look and feel of the, of the franchise. So that's kind of what drew me in. I remember kind of seeing that that kind of Joe was kind of was was the creative. Um, force behind this game and i was like yeah i'm all in because his his comic books are just crazy you know they really are kind of like big and bulky and chunky a bit like kind of gears of war of in <laughs> with, with mm. x-men yeah and it was absolutely yeah. a warhammer it yes like, yes it, well? absolutely so it just that kind of drew me in and i ended up really i ended up staying and really enjoying the game cool so it was absolutely fantastic yeah do we know did it say anything about when we can expect it or is it just sort of just being announced now and Yes, 2018. Uh, so it was like 2018, so we've got a year and change. Oh, was that... So that, that was it, just, yes. 20, just 2018? Just 2018. Oh, okay. So yeah, so they, they basically just stuck their kind of marker in the sand. Here's a CGI title. Like I say, but IGN will be will be unveiling more and more kind of throughout the month of May. Um, this is their IGN first. So they will be un- mm. just unveiling a little bit more um, throughout the month. So that's quite... That's quite cool. But before we head over to to the VR news desk, before we're poised, we're going to go over there. Um, I just have to say that speaking of IGN, IGN um, unfiltered this month is a really interesting two hour interview with Peter Molyneux. So it's oh, wow. friend of the show Ryan McCaffrey and um, and Peter Molyneux just sitting there chatting very openly chatting about Fable, um, about Fable, about Fable, about <laughs> <laughs> about Connect, about Milo, about um, Goddess, about everything. You know, this is about how he how he lied his way into his first creating his first game I sat on the train I, I had a lengthy train journey on um, Tuesday I sat on the train and I was just I was going to be doing some work but I was so enthralled by this interview um, that I, it was just amazing two hours, two hours long, two hour chat Peter Molyneux, Ryan McCaffrey one on one, IGN Unfiltered an absolute must listen if, you in, if you're interested in 
video games or, or the, the kind of the behind the scenes this was a very kind of candid and you kind of get the feeling that it could have gone on a lot longer <laughs> you know he talks about fable legends he talks about kind of the closure of Lionhead, um and he even talks about kind of the dream team that he would want to put together if phil spencer came to him and said we're going to create another fable it's it's a, it's a great podcast it's a really good listen Wow, does he talk a little bit about the glory days with Bullfrog and Populous, or is that a bit too too out there? Oh no, he goes through all of that. He talks so in two hours. Yeah, he goes all through all of that. He goes through all of that and Dungeon Keeper and and yeah, no, he kind of he hits all of the Molyneux beats. Wow, fantastic! Oh, great, I look forward to listening to that. Does he? Um, I was going to say he's, he's uh, stopped his his press silence then. Yes, absolutely, and occasionally he swears as well. When it's really cool here, and Peter Molyneux swear, there was just something very cool about it, you know. And it was just like, but he's very cool. He is just like how he just seems like a happy chap, um, and he's just like the wheels are off, and he's just really kind of a very open, candid chat uh, with Ryan McCaffrey. Um, so yeah, so that's IGM filtered this month. Um, really, really good in, um, uh, interview. So. That's it for our regular news. It's time to go over to the VR news desk for all the latest in VR. VR desk. Yeah, so here we are at the VR news desk once again. Welcome, everybody, especially my fine colleagues here, James and Anthony. You made it this far. Are you looking forward to the VR desk? Oh, yes. As ever. Oh, fantastic. Great. I'm rubbing my hands together here. What have we got? Um, first of all, Unity CEO chatted a little bit about where he sees VR going um, recently at the uh, <clears throat> VRLA. Um, you're going to ask me what the VRLA, um, <laughs> VRLA thing is, aren't you? It's virtual reality conference in LA, I think. Um, what do you mean so- you think? You're the CEO <laughs> uh, so of the news desk. Is- Surely that's a little bit of information you should have Googled. <laughs> yeah. You could have even made it up and just not told us. We just would have to be unaware. I'm going to have to just make myself look better on that, aren't I? <laughs> just do a little bit of tinkering with the sound file, um, and then we'll be okay. Yeah, but the thing is, the website says VRLA Expo 2017. You know, it's not it's not easy to find out what is what, what they are. VRLA 2017. Okay, Google. <laughs> VR VRLA, the virtual reality conference it's set in LA. <laughs> Virtual was or- right. augmented reality. I was conference. right the whole time. Fantastic. Thanks for that. As when I went to the official web page, it right. wouldn't let me click anywhere because it wanted me to put an email address in before it let me like click. So um, John Riccitello, um I hope I've got that correctly. Um, had a, he had a keynote. He's a keynote speaker at, the, at this conference, and he talked a little bit about where VR was going. Um, this guy is the. <clears throat> Not only is he a Unity CEO, he's also worked as the COO and CEO at EA as well in the past. Um, so he's a bit of an industry veteran. Um, so what he said was, he basically, it was a speech tempering expectation, really. And I think we've we've all sort of had this chat as well between, between ourselves and come to this conclusion um, before now. But basically, he said, mm-hmm. maybe there's a little bit too much hype for VR. And because of that, people might get the what he considered to be incorrect view that VR may be failing, but he says that that isn't what's happening. It's just that, in his opinion, uh, it's, it would be impossible for it to have hit the heights that the hype machine gave it um, within the time limits that, that the media have reported. He said, you know, with the money and everything um, and the, the technology that we've got, you're not going to it would be impossible to, to get there. He said, so it's a little bit about the sort of media giving people false expectation of where where VR is going to be which then gives you a bit of disappointment and he did um, a graph which he called the gap of disappointment and he <laughs> gives a <laughs> he gives a red line which is sort of the media's expectation or yeah the, the, what the what the media or the industry no not the industry but the media um, their projected expectation that the public should expect against what he sees should happen, um, taking into account, well, the realities of, of what he thinks it, the industry can do. Um, and so there's a great disparity until we get to about 2022. And around about 2022, 2023 is where the lines cross. 
and we get to this sort of idea that we've been given of what VR can do and that we'll all be using it and starting to find it um, maybe not essential but certainly something in our day-to-day lives at, at, where these lines meet as well after they meet in his projection it skyrockets up um, so once it sort of hits there it's, it seems that it's going to thrive and become bigger and bigger and bigger um, so I might put that link in the, in the show notes so people can see the gap of disappointment because <laughs> it's apart from a great title it's quite an interesting little graph um, so he also said that along the lines of this this is this is what he talks about regarding this gap he said that he read recently that the VR AR marketplace is going to be 164 billion dollars three years from today um, and he says that the entire game industry hardware and software including China is only about two-thirds that size so he says that maybe these expectations are just getting a little bit out of hand he says after that he said i think ultimately the world of ar and vr the world of 3d computing is ultimately going to be as big as the internet it's going to be trillions but we're not there yet this is the thing we're not there yet and we've got to measure ourselves um so it's all about just tempering expectations, isn't it? You know, which is it's, it's a good practice to do. Yeah, it's, it's nice to see someone actually come out at one of these larger VA, uh, VR conferences and actually try and do this. Because I think a lot of the, the news that you've always reported on about people saying it's the next big thing, next year's going to be where it takes off, we're going to get millions, <laughs> we're all going to be rich. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I think our own expectations have been tempered by what we've seen out in the wild. And yeah, by getting involved in, in the reality, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, it's nice to see someone coming on stage and going, guys, we we need to address this. We can't just keep yeah. trying to sell headsets and just keep giving people wave shooters. So, um, But yeah, yeah it's, it's true. As soon as soon I think as soon as it starts breaking into the normal everyday, shall we say, as, as soon as you can just think, well, actually, I'm going to do a VR call as much as I do a Skype call. We're still some way off that. I, I think some of his timelines seem optimistic still. Because it is still yeah. very much a niche and expensive tech, but um, at least at least someone's trying to yeah breathe yeah, some reality sort of like, into the situation. Simmer, simmer down, yeah. everyone. He tries yeah. to do it in a good way. I mean, you you can watch the video um, from from Road to VR um, dot com, and it but it's it sounds like what you're talking about there is almost the is it the Ghana hype cycle and the, the hype cycle basically you have that technology trigger that we had with VR and that goes all the way up to the peak of inflated expectation yeah so that's kind of where we're that's kind of where we were and then you have the trough of disillusionment which is kind of when you go it's gonna be everything it's gonna be amazing and then we realize kind of what it is but then after that you have that you have this slope you have this steady incline that gets to that that my brain come on gets to the plateau of productivity and that's kind of where we want to get and that's kind of what you're talking about that's that kind of 2020 that's the kind of where where we'll be when you start seeing vr kind of being used all the time and that's probably what he's talking about there and he's yeah i think you're right i like that the plateau of productivity and that's the point where the re- that's where we need you to realize to. the reality rather than mm. than the idea you start to see see, mm. see the truth in it or whatever. Oh, that's really cool. And like you say, start to use uh, use it in the in the way that it was always intended. It might not be the way that you were told at the beginning, but it starts to be mm. used in a productive way, even if it's not exactly as you were told at the outset ten years ago. Absolutely. And that's it. And that's what happens after the technology trigger. You get to that inflated expectation. And that's it. Because you hear something. And we do this all the time. You know, I come across this time and time again in the projects that I work on where everybody kind of has their idea of what it needs to be. And then, you know, maybe just as you roll out or whatever, you do hit that that trough of disillusionment where people are going, well, maybe, you know, it's not what I expected. Or and then you just have that gradual kind of upslope to that, that plateau of productivity. That, that I'm enjoying so we have the trough of disillusionment, the plateau of acceptability, the the gap of disappointment. <laughs> these are, these the <laughs> this is gold, mate. This is gold for your next presentation. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, you know, you have the technology trigger. The technology trigger goes to the peak of inflated expectation. Then there is a downslide to the trough of disillusionment and up to the slope of enlightenment, which leads to the plateau of productivity. I can't tell, Darren, whether he's taking the mick or whether this is actually some of his presentation material. <laughs> I'm 
generally this is generally the Garner's hype cycle. There's if you Google that, oh, okay. If you, uh, G-A-R-T-N-E-R Google that hype cycle you will see what I'm talking about I was on the balcony of befuddlement to that point in time just... <laughs> balcony of befuddlement <laughs> uh, and now you're on the cusp of the utopia of understanding <laughs> <laughs> oh you mock me but this is true oh, no, I mean, it's got, got Gartner's name on it man there must have been some research money spent on that I imagine um, so he, go, he goes on and he, he makes a bit of a comparison to what we've already seen historically with technologies uh, and applies that to where VR might go. So I'll just I'll, I'll read you the quote because it'll be easier than me paraphrasing. Um, so he said, some of the great applications that will show up in AR and VR and did show up in gaming and mobile were written by very small teams and they were ridiculously innovative. But markets matured to scale when major developers brought out their version of Star Wars or Marvel or these other things. And a lot of times these things can cost 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 million to build. Um, all of the sci-fi or superhero movies cost over 100 million dollars to build. And for those products to show up, for them to have a reasonable chance of penetrating a market well enough to break even or better. If there isn't at least a very near term probability of 100 million devices in the marketplace that can play it, they won't build it. They won't build it because it can't make any money. And so what needs to change for our market to get to a place um, that makes any sense at all for you to get the return of investment that you want is we're going to need to see the promise of that first 100 million devices and then the promise of the second 100 million. A couple hundred million devices creates an umbrella for the entire industry to flourish. And I think we're a few years away from that. Um, and I suppose that comes down to cost as well doesn't it you know these devices the technology needs to increase and get better and, and cheapen so that so that the the technology becomes more accessible to the man mm. in the street because you know psvr is the cheapest but it's still no it's it's still no cakewalk is it at, at a playstation plus the psvr you know it's still it's still a few quid um so also he said and it, it, it's quite inspiring with, with his chat as well i know it sounds a little bit like like it's going on the um, plateau of pain, or whatever it was called. Um, <laughs> but he said that his sense is that we're going to see full flowering around 2019 uh, and see things beginning to take the shape of device adoption in 2018. So it's a, we're, it's a way off when people are going to start adopting this in their droves, according to this guy. Um, but he says it's guaranteed to happen. It won't happen at the timetable that people tell us. It's going to happen. It'll be slower because of the prices. But then he's finally, the final summation, which I really like what he says here. Um, if you run into anybody, he said, that works for Oculus or anyone that works for Vive or Samsung or Gear or Magic Leap, etc. These guys have invested billions, absolutely billions. And they've got billions more to go. OK, and I'm going to skip some of this now. Blah, blah, blah. He says they're not creating Google VR. What they're creating is the opportunity for you to be in the same position that EA and Activision were in the early 80s when they created their companies to get the game industry off the ground. So these guys in the industry are creating the same opportunity that the mobile game giants of now, like King and Supercell and Machine Zone, had in the world of mobile to get their companies off the ground. A simple equation, mm. he says, they created the opportunity. And he's talking to the devs here. You will create the industry. And then he says, and I, and I can't wait. And I read that, and I just think... That is so exciting, saying that the VR industry, and it makes sense because it's, it's so in its early days, is an opportunity for developers and innovators to start businesses. It could be the next Facebook, you know, it could be the next, the next Candy Crush King uh, publisher, um, could be the next Activision or EA from, from way back in the day. And I think along with his message of temperance and just simmering down with the expectation i really love that that he also said that this is a doorway this is a portal this is an opportunity if you've got faith in this that you could really you know go out there and make something massive and the the, the, the small developers working in little groups with ideas now could be the billionaires of the future and i just i just really love that stumped you haven't i <laughs> <laughs> James is still looking at the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> so, so, I think I'm somewhere near acceptance on this graph. Um, <laughs> but that's what he says anyway. So um, we'll see. We'll yes. see. Um, 
so what have we got uh, else to talk to? Yeah, some add-ons for the Vive. So <laughs> there's a few add-ons for the Vive. Um, Vive is going to get eye tracking. Wow, so soon. So with some lenses that you can like bolt on um, on a dev kit, eye tracking is going to come out for the Vive in uh, in a dev kit at the moment. Is there's no consumer version that we know about yet, um, and this is coming soon. I'm not sure when it's actually going to come out, um, but yeah, it's going to rec- it's going to recognise where you're looking in 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 VR. Now we talked about this before about adverts, knowing that you've looked at them, but there are some other uses for it, um, like I suppose looking at a menu. You know, you could look at start, and that will light up, and you can pick it. But that's not really amazing, is it? You could just sort of turn your head, you know. But there's a thing called favited rendering, which it's useful for. And what favited rendering does is when you're in VR, when you've got the headset on, it sharpens all the pixels that you're looking at because it knows where you're looking. So where you're looking exactly at that, it'll make all that look really nice resolution, but all the stuff that you're not looking at, it'll blur it out, which saves resource. So it enables machines that aren't VR at a VR spec to be able to run a, v- a VR system because of that overhead wow. that it saves. So that's quite clever. That's really cool. That's, that's really a cool. that's a nifty little trick. I've never yeah. even thought of it. So yeah, it's like you're looking at this now. So I mean, it does render the rest. I mean, you could almost say it doesn't even need to render the, the back, you know. But uh, but it just hmm. it just lowers. It just saves. It saves lots of horsepower by just just de-resin it. I don't know what it does, but it just like minimise. Yeah, then, yeah, something like maybe. that. Yeah, yeah, low textures for what you're not for what you're not looking at, and high textures for what you are looking at, and things like that. So. I think that's really... I just think it's an amazing idea. Um, the guy that tested it said that the laptop that, it was, that was running it was not up to the VR minimum spec. And they tested it with it using this favited rendering, and it worked like a dream. But then what they did is they took away the favited rendering, made it render it all, and it chugged like a dog. So it proved that it, proved that it you know, yeah. that it worked. Um, so I just thought that that's, re- that's really great. You know, when we talk about getting the cost down and things like that, that brings the price of the PC entry lower because you're not going to need a high spec PC to be rendering everything with the bells and whistles all the time to hit that that key 90 frames per second. It'll just render what you're looking at because it can recognise where your eyes are looking. Um, I think there's a bit of work to go on this um, regarding the sort of latency it needs to be really fast for you not to notice. You know, so when you look at something, it needs to be sort of instant. So there, there's a bit of work to go on it, but. Um, this this solution, which is called, um, where is it? It's by Seven Invention, um, and it's called A Glass. A Glass. Uh, this is going to help. This is going to help do that. It's also an aspect of it for people that are short sighted like me. I mean, I wear contact lenses, but it's always a bit of a faff if someone's got glasses because I have to either ask them to take them off or I have to like sort of wind out the front of the uh, HMD, which then decreases the field of view for the for the person that's wearing glasses which is a shame um and for the first time the other day i actually was messing around with my vr headset without my contact lenses in so i took my glasses off and had a look look through and i thought because it's so close to my eyes i'd just see it perfectly but i was exactly as short-sighted in the vr as i am in the real world and i don't understand how that works i could probably look it up but i haven't done but i was amazed that i couldn't read the text even though the lenses are about, you know, a centimetre away from my eye, something about the way those lenses work, it was as if I was in the real world and it was just as blurry as it would have been. And then I put my glasses on and it was fine. I was like, wow. I guess it's still trying to put them at a sensible... I guess it knows what, say, three foot away is and tries to render yeah, well, accordingly. It, it does, and it works. It's really weird, because I thought I'd just see everything perfectly. <laughs> um, I, do, I do wonder... Yeah, sorry, that's just got me... I do wonder whether you could almost pull that in. Because it can maybe you'd need eye tracking to do that, because then it could judge where you were looking, and you know, like at the opticians, where you look at that yeah. balloon in the distance or whatever, and it, it knows where you're focusing it, so they can they can work it out. So maybe eye tracking could do that, so you could play VR without glasses or contact lenses in, and it would render everything for the for your prescription, if you like, without lenses. But what they're doing anyway, I don't think that can be done at the moment because they're also bringing out prescription versions of this. Where the lenses that've got the eye tracking in will also can also be made to your uh, your glasses prescription as well. 
Um, so interesting. Mm. At the moment, as I say, a bit of work to be done. The guy that tested it said it's slightly uncomfortable sort of pushing against his nose. It pushes the lenses out further, so it increases the field of view and stuff like that. But essentially, it's uh, a step in the right direction for getting this uh, eye tracking out there and just... Just for the, I think the favited rendering is uh, is just a case in point. It's, it just sounds sounds really cool. Um, there's other things you could use it for, but they're not. They don't sound as impressive to me. Animate the eyes of your avatar in VR. That's what eye tracking could be used for. I wouldn't be dropping the money on on it for that. I, uh, I can imagine how it could work. That that would be quite good though if you're in like a chat room, or like um, like rec room, or just even like a general chat space, because that would at least add some human. To the yeah. dead-eyed stare that you otherwise get from an avatar or so. Well, at the so moment, at least you've had that, you could see where you were looking as well as where you were facing. The eyes do follow you now because, like, I've been in—I've not been in much in VR social um, circles, but when I, I have done it once or twice, and I was amazed because as you walk to the left or right, the eyes do follow you, but they're just trained to follow the avatar you're looking at. I think, you know, rather yeah. than so. Yeah. yeah, I suppose it, I was—I was impressed by that, but yeah, I suppose it would bring a, an extra bit of life, wouldn't it, to them? Um, it can also be used for si- to simulate depth of field effects um, and be used for conscious and unconscious input inside of VR apps, which is probably selecting things in menus and adverts registering that you've looked at them. Um, but it's a few quid. It's $220 Whoa. for the dev kit. Um, so there we go. So that's eye tracking coming to the Vive. And I think there's, eye- there's uh, incentives or initiatives, sorry, of uh, eye tracking coming to Oculus as well um, and maybe even PSVR. Because I'm sure the technology will work across the board, I imagine. Um, so also we've got a release date for the HTC Vive's Deluxe Audio Strap, which just makes wearing it a lot easier than the Velcro that you get with it as standard. Um, this is another uh, add-on, which is $99.99, or £100, ninety nine ninety nine pounds And this just makes it so much easier to wear the headset. It seems more like a PSVR-inspired um Right, okay. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of helmet, if you like. With uh, Instead of being Velcro straps, it's, it's hard plastic. And it, twi- it looks like it, twi- it twists around at the back. Um, and just get and it's mm-hmm. got earf- ear- uh, earphones built in. It looks really good. Everybody that's tested it said it's really cool. So that's coming out. You know, I'm not going to rush out and buy it because, you know, the Vive has a lot of money on its own. Um, but for those that want it, it's, it's there and available. Um, what else have we got? Oh, that's it. That's it. So we've got the uh, the eye tracking and the headset. They're the two things coming. I was thinking about this because there's quite a few add-ons that have sort of popped their head over the surface um, since the Vive came out. You've got the eye tracking. So, so say you, say you wanted the super duper set. You buy your Vive first of all, and you, and you and your PC, and then you think, oh well, there's all these extras. It's like if you wanted the bells and whistles, you've got the eye tracking at two twenty. The headset at ninety nine dollars. You got that Vive tracker at ninety nine dollars. If you want to eliminate the wire and not be tethered to your computer, you got to get the TP Cast at two hundred forty nine dollars. So I added that up, and it comes to six hundred and sixty seven dollars extra. Yeah, and I was like, "Ouch! It's a dear do." <laughs> <laughs> See that Pro controller doesn't look so bad right now, <laughs> does it? <laughs> I tell you, the Xbox Elite controller doesn't sound too so bad in comparison to all that. Um, but we talked about it before, and I just sort of think and hope that. Rather than I'm not, I'm not bothered. I'm happy with my vibe as it is. You know, I'm not going to be getting all this stuff. But what I hope is that the next generation, year or so down the line, that this is like a shopping list that will go on. That I'm really hoping that hmm. it'll be. I think a better headset, a better you know, sitting better on your head. It goes without saying. They're all going to improve there. The tracker probably just cheapen, but the TP cast to make it wireless and the eye tracking hmm. are things that I think could not just could but should be built in to um, future consumer models because it's just going to make it better, more robust and make more people want one, I think. There's, there'll be more desirability because people for a start won't, feel, won't be tethered and that, that eye yeah. tracking well, it, it, it's just, it just sounds amazing and because of that favited rendering it'll allow people to, to not have to spend as much on their computer, which can only be a good thing. Hmm. 
but you imagine all of that kind of being coupled into Vive 2, but Vive stays the same price. You know, it stays the same price, but Vive 2, but, you know, so instead of being cheaper, it stays the same price, but you get all of those features. You know, you get the tracker, you get mm. the proper headphones and, and a better fitting set, and you get wireless and eye tracking. You know, that kind of makes a, a very um, attractive Vive 2, doesn't definitely it? Definitely does. It definitely does. The thing is, that, that, I mean, we're talking a few years down the line, but currently that six six seven dollars is not far off the price of a vive um but yeah that would be fantastic if they for me you'd want the eye tracking and the headset and the tp cast bit all built in um the tracker i think they could still sell that as an additional peripheral maybe maybe you don't need that but i think the other things as time moves forward and people are going to expect stuff especially as they're released as add-ons you know potentially in the next six months or so I think it's mm. not outrageous to sort of expect that they'd be on the Vive too, and I think that it would be really good. Just don't bring it out soon because I want to enjoy my Vive without thinking that I'm really out of date. Uh, so we've also got there was uh, <clears throat> there was uh, at the Vision VR AR Summit uh, keynote we had some interesting news was pitched where. Unity tools are going to bring real-time CGI and 360 video together. And they did a demo where they basically showed, um, you know, like a 360 picture. It looked, it looked like a still picture to me. It's so one of these 360 pictures you can explore. But there's a new tool in Unity where you can seamlessly mix or merge your CGI into the 360 picture. And so what they did, they had a nice sort of view of an outside area. Um, I think it was near a, a marina or something like that, that you could look around in in VR, like most people have probably had a go on that that sort of thing. And then in, with the Unity engine, they just brought a CGI dinosaur in there, and it was marching around, and you could see that. Uh, and I thought it was really cool. And then they added another one that just added birds just flying in the skies. And it just added a, it just added a great feeling of realism. Well, maybe the dinosaur. Maybe realism is the wrong word, <laughs> but you know what I mean. It it, made, it brought the it brought the environment to life, cool. and they added things like lens flare to the sun, so, and they made it so that if you, they put a light source behind the sun using the, the the CGI aspect of the video, it's like two two videos going side by side, and they added a light source behind the sun, and when they did that, it meant when the birds flew past the sun, they actually disappeared. You couldn't see them as they would happen in real life. Now, without doing that. If it was just a, a still image, um, they would just fly past the sun and you'd still see them. So it adds this extra, this extra sort of life to these these 360 environments that you can, that you can explore. And I just thought, wouldn't that be amazing on Google Earth? Because they've already brought out a VR Google Earth, which I've had an exploring. But on the major landmarks, if they added things real thing, like if you were sort of near Big Ben, they added the chimes of Big Ben and. Um, or pigeons flying off the Tower of London, you know, just just subtle little touches like that. It could, but it could make a big difference and just make it just make it stand out even more. I mean, Google VR is quite amazing anyway. But I just thought using that, if they do choose to, it would just uh, it could just be really cool. And obviously, there's the opportunity for developers to make some amazing sort of hybrid experiences of reality and fantasy using that 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 Unity tool. I just thought it was really cool. Yeah, it's nice to see that Unity is sort of uh, focusing on tools that will actually help the VR development because Unity is a great, great platform for just getting stuff up and running in and uh, developing like nice games. In fact, the games you can develop and are getting larger and larger. But um, yeah, the fact they're taking VR very seriously and putting their their efforts to this, I think, shows shows where they they think it's going to lie the the future. Yeah, it gives me a little bit of confidence when you see these these big players and big hitters sort of drawing a line in the sand or putting their investment into this it, it, it gives you hope doesn't it that that they're, that they're not going to try and back the wrong horse on purpose are they mm. and it, it did look quite simple i mean i don't know i'm not a developer or anything but she the, the girl that was doing it she said this is how simple it is and she like for instance the birds there was just a few and she said if you want more birds you simply grab the slider and just pull it to the, you know take it from the left to the right and it just increases the density and, and she did it and it did it was like I think she said it was very sort of Hitchcocky and it was very the birds. Um, and she said, if you get freaked out, just slide it back down and then you're back to just one or two. And I just thought, wow, you know, so on the fly, dynamic changes within this uh, within this, this little VR world bubble that she'd made. I thought it was really cool. 
And so the uh, the last piece of news that I've got for you is about a Kickstarter that we've had for a VR glove. In fact, it's called VR glove, G L U V, and the VR glove not only allows you to have more manipulation with your fingers it's a haptic glove so you're actually going to re- be able to reach out and touch and feel in vr which is pretty amazing it looks um it looks a bit big and chunky like almost like you're some kind of cartoon character but it looks like apart from the the sort of aesthetic looks the functionality in vr seems quite amazing um it's pla- it's past its kickstarter really quickly um it, it's got 22 days left, I think, now. And it's got $137,000 pledged of its $100,000 uh, sorry, $100, goal um, with 22 days to go. So it's it's flown past its, uh, its opening gambit, if you like. And I've watched the video of this, and it just looks amazing. Um, once you're in VR here, they're saying that you can touch like a balloon and feel it in your hands if you're wearing these gloves. And if you squeeze hard enough, you'll feel the resistance, and then it'll pop, and you'll feel that. You can hold a spring in the game world and feel it pushing against you. Feel the springiness of a spring to that to that level of detail for every finger. Because looking at the, the, the gif that they got playing on their website, it almost looks like one of those gloves that... Uh, oh, what are the, the, the Wraith Riders? Is it Wraith Riders in Lord of the Rings? Yeah, one of the Nazgul. Yeah, 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 that's it. it. Like it looks their armored like glove. Yeah, an armored glove. And I guess it should be called the VR like, gauntlet, shouldn't it? <laughs> and I guess they must have just got like servers and servos and like, like tension stopping you from crushing it. Like the extra um, exoskeleton goes around the outside must control how much it will open or close, so it locks your hands accordingly. But hmm. it's an interesting, it's an interesting twist. But I, like, I wonder how this is going to work in-game, because doing the hardware is one thing, but like getting integrated into things like Unity or people's you know, just own homebrew engines or stuff must be quite another. There must be a whole interesting set of uh, APIs they've got to feed back onto this. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's as if the guys that have all pledged all this money <laughs> maybe have got the inside word, because yeah. it sh- the website, for instance, shows the games that it's compatible with at the moment, and there's not many. I think there's about three. Um, one of them being Climby, which is um, a game where you climb. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> and that would be really good to sort of feel, to, you know, to grip the rocks as you climb would be amazing. But, yeah, I'm not sure how, how easily it is for them to integrate it. But watching their little sizzle reel of what you can do in the way that it recognises every yeah. digit. And also it's going to be able to easily bolt on either your Vive uh, controller or your Oculus one. Um and that's it. You just it's going to have a sort of a, an attachment, a slidey attachment, and you can put either of them in, and then that's it. That's it. That's it. Apparently, it hashtag it. just works. It just works. Yeah, there's a thousand developers <laughs> just screamed at me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, you, it says you'll be able to if you're playing a gun game, you'll be able to feel the the tension in the trigger of the gun that you you're, you're holding, and and probably feel the. The, the, the barrel at the front, if that's the right terminology, or when you're holding one of these bow and arrows in the in the millionth wave shooter, but let's not be too cynical. You'll let go and you'll feel <laughs> and you'll feel the you feel the arrow and you'll feel the release and the twang of the string, and it's just like wow, man. And again, you know, like the VR desk often is, it's all a vision of where it's gonna get to, isn't it? But it's I, I love the fact that people have got something like this working because it's. It may be homebrew. This may just go into a just like a small selection of homebrew apps, but I love the fact that this is actually now a reality. Because, yeah. as you say, like in ten years' time, this might be far more amenable to mass production. It might be in the Unity engine, and it might just you know it might just work. But you got to start somewhere. Yeah, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. The thing that just flummoxes me a little bit is with all this haptic stuff, the haptic gloves, oh, let's just add that onto the cost, shall we? That's about another <laughs> that's another, that's another $300 or $400 that you're going to need, um, depending on when you're back. Um, it's just kind of the social aspect for me that confuses me a little bit, because I like to do things with my family or friends, and it's just the opposite of that, the VR thing. This, for me, would be a dream at, like, 14, when I was sort of locked in playing Dungeon Master all the time on my own. Um, but 
it's I've never really uh, I don't play VR as much as I'd like to because of that because I feel a little bit like I'm I'm ignoring people and getting dressed up in a haptic suit putting the gloves on <laughs> and, and <laughs> having your own dressing room before <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your butler dressing Sam, you come help VR. me with my gauntlets. Houses in the future will come with their own dressing room for the ladies and um, a VR dressing room for, for the geeky guys. Um, not that it's only for guys and uh, not that only ladies have dressing rooms. Um, but, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'd just leave it there. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think, I, think, I think you're right. You know, I do think that VR is very kind of that one person. You know, apart from things like you know, keep talking, no one explodes, and those kind of party games, the majority of VR is about that one person experiencing that one experience. And I think that's it. You know, and I think you know you are you are very um, unique in kind of wanting to kind of share all of this all the time with with your fellow. Where a lot of people will go, you know, I'm going to go and play some VR. And that's See it. You, you know, and yeah. it's just you that's doing it rather than kind of I need to bring everyone else along. Yeah, I think you're right. It's probably just one of my little foib- foibles. Um, yeah, mm. I think you're absolutely right because most people just would do that. Yeah, and I just have some weird thing about that. Um, but do, <laughs> that's enough of me on the couch. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Enough, enough of the psychological exam. But, but just because you mentioned, yeah, it's Dr. Anthony. Yeah, I've got problems. Holy moly. Right, and on that explosive note, uh, that's about it for this episode. Big thank you again for listening. And don't forget, you can keep up with us at gamersofalostspark.com. You can also find us on Facebook. On Twitter, we're at Lost Spark Pod. Um, you can also find us on YouTube and the Gamers of Lost Spark, PS4 Community, and Xbox One Club. Des, where can people find you online? Yeah, you can find me as Wythermator on PS4, Xbox One, and Twitch. Daz a Gamer on YouTube, and at Daz Whittam on Twitter. Perfect. James, where can people catch up with you? I am Big Sheep on Twitter, Xbox Live, PSN, and Nintendo. Ah, uh, he's got the whole set. And for me, I am Chessman on Xbox Live and Nintendo. I'm PS-Chessman on the PlayStation Network and Chessman UK on Twitter. Don't forget, if you have any feedback, please send it to our email address. That's feedback at gamersofthelostbark.com. Also, if you're feeling generous, please give us a review on iTunes. Um, so, Will, that's about it. Say goodbye, guys. Bye. Cheers. Bye.